I, I know that this is probably maybe even a personal failing on some level, but every time I feel like I'm just starting to have a discussion about horror, I feel like someone should very loudly start playing the score to Cape Fear. Boom, 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 boom. Which I think is the greatest like horror scary it's score so good. ever recorded. It's so good. <laughs> just love it to death. There's a great album by Mike Patton. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He was in Faith No More and Mr. Bungle. Oh, I know Faith like No More. Uh, but he had a band called Phantomas that did a whole album of like, and it was a rock band setup, but mm-hmm. they did um, covers of classic horror movie themes, and and as well as they did like The Godfather and some of the stuff like that. But they do Cape Fear, and it's like almost better than the original soundtrack. Damn, version. that's it's something so I'm gonna good. have to track down. Yeah, really, really, really good. It's called Phantomas, the director's cut. But you know what? We're not actually reviewing Phantomas or Cape Fear or music or music in any <laughs> form. If you catch me talking about music again, just say, "All right, Cyrus, ask Corey if you can have a music show already." Uh, appropriate to this show we will just change the channel (laughs) exactly but uh no we're talking about horror and you know what let's just let's just jump right in there's a lot of horror there's there's a lot of there's there's so many horrors on leog i mean (laughs) wait what what um our driver you know what i want to talk about this film that i encourage you to watch with lots of uh uh like codicil saying like addendum going look i'm not saying this is a good movie because it, it totally is not a good movie but Psychic Experiment is so out of control, retarded, <coughs> nonsensical, multicolored <sighs> stuff that I couldn't stop watching it. This is just out on DVD from Lionsgate, and it stars a whole slew of people from historically from the horror industry, including the the, the uh, okay, Adrian, Adrian King. King from yeah. the, the surviving girl from the original Friday the 13th who hasn't been in anything in forever and she's yeah like, I thought she was dead she's the main villain in this Katie Featherston from the uh, uh, the Paranormal Activity Paranormal has a small role in this uh, I lo- I was pleased as hell to see Reggie Bannister who's like the guy with the ponytail in the Phantasm films he's <laughs> one of the main characters playing a, 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 a just out of jail child molester Creepy. great role so, great role for any actor as near as it's possible to tell you what this movie's about because yeah good luck Trust me, it's not really about... <laughs> it's hard to say any... Yeah, I don't know. Oh. Uh, I'm, I can't have a hard time even phrasing the sentence structure around telling you <laughs> this. But um, it's a small town, and this guy has just come back to it. And I can't even... I guess he was... was oh, he's working for a scientific institute there in the town, I guess. I wasn't sure. Was he a cop, or was he actually a doctor? You, you're already thinking more about this movie than I was, I was capable of. Well... So he went there, and then everyone's having hallucinations, and things are getting gooey, and people are dying for no reason, and things, people that are on fire are appearing out of thin air. And, people are getting gooey. I like the way you describe that, because that's exactly what and happens. And they're getting sucked into walls for no apparent reason, and and apparently it's like this scientific people there have put microchips in people's heads as part of a study that gives them psychic powers and some of them are receivers and some of them are senders or something i love that the big surprise of this movie is ruined by its title like what's going on what could possibly it's like it's a psychic experiment it's like really it's a fucking psychic you told us that at the damn you well what does any of the stuff that's actually happening have to do with psychic powers i mean this is some strange unfor un never before mentioned psychic ability that i mean this wasn't even in the psionics list in D D of the stuff that these people can do you know i mean it's they make like i said they make strange on fire people they do like they do a weird combination of like the thing effects to people and then like a neo video drone where like the guy's cell phone wires are crawling up through him and the best thing i can say about this movie and believe me this is the this is the most generous i can be is and i think i think luke actually brought this up is that i, I like that they're trying to do some practical effects and not every single shot is cg <coughs> and especially for a movie with what is clearly a 12 dollar budget yeah that's impressive and that's it <laughs> that's all i <laughs> yeah, got i mean I, this movie's a piece of shit. Oh, no, let's no just be let's yeah. just be honest. It's a piece of shit. They do get a little bit of credit for two things. A somehow assembling a fairly stellar cast, like you were talking about earlier. Um, another guy that you guys may recognize, Glenn Morshower, who is a redheaded dude who has been On the 24. general or admiral or colonel. In every movie you've ever seen in your life. He was a regular character on 24 for a long time, I think. Yeah, and pro- probably most famously in the three Transformers films. He's like the big yeah, head you, general maybe. guy. Fuck, well, Fuck those movies. 
<laughs> I just meant a lot of people saw them. I nope. I, I, ref- I have erased them from my memory. Okay. Wow, all of them? What? All of what? Oh, wow. That's going a little far, I think. But <laughs> uh, also Kathy Lampkin, who plays the giant lady in the Texas Chainsaw, either one or both of the remakes. I think maybe just the second remake. Uh, I feel who, like she may have also was she also in uh, was she also in No Country for Old Men as the the Temple Texas lady I don't know no but no you know, as the as the uh, fucking trailer park attendant pretty much every woman oh, cast maybe. in this film, anyway you will recognize Kathy Lampkin if you yeah. have seen any horror films almost whatsoever. every woman cast in this film was either going to end up as a horror scream queen or as a porn strip, star as a porn yeah. star and yeah. some of them have done both so <laughs> uh, I mean it's that kind of film but you know what anyway so it did it I was sorry just real no, quick no, I no. was just saying that it does get credit for assembling a decent cast and for attempting some practical effects you know I, I feel like it was so stupid, insane, that I was entertained by it. I mean, it's just nonstop. Mm-hmm. And I would rather watch something as terrible as this film is, and I'm not saying it's not, but that's <laughs> constantly doing weird shit. I mean, it never stops. There's no boring parts. It's like, here's something else that doesn't make any sense. It's totally fucked up. Yeah. But then uh, yet another just slasher film that's going down the road that has a really high budget and decent actors in it. I'd rather see this than the Friday the 13th remake. Any oh. Day oh. Oh. Whoa. Sorry. No. I would because I'm Veto. like. I'm like. No, 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 no. Sorry, no. man. I've seen that movie a thousand fucking times. This movie, you've never seen anything like it and you will never see anything like it again because it's, Yeah, I mean. Uh, to, to what? It's I think you're giving this movie way too much credit. I'm not giving it credit. I'm saying. It is what it is. Uh, it's entertaining in and of, in the same way that you tell me, Brian, how much you like some of these really terrible movies. That I will liked say along the way. to that point, I will say it's like picking up a VHS early or early eighties horror movie that when you pop in has no narrative structure whatsoever. Oh yeah, and there are plenty of those. Yeah. However, uh, yeah, I think there, there reaches a certain point where that loses its charm, and, it, and I think that point was like nineteen eighty nine. Uh, I will say it may work. It may work better with a six pack and a group of friends. Yes. Oh no. I yes, definitely. Totally, totally advise that. Yes. And I, I think the real star of the movie is Katie Featherston's wreck. So isn't that the real the star of every film? Yes. Yeah. At least the ones that she's in, which I think is pretty much this in Paranormal Activity. But, <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway, let's go ahead and move on because less. T- we don't need to spend more time than that on that. Agreed. And let's talk about uh, you know our buddies at Synapse. We love Synapse Film, and uh, they put out so much good stuff. Like they put out Frankenhooker earlier this year. Yes, which, they did on Blu-ray, which was. A, a, I love that you said that after you said good stuff. Oh man, I love Frankenhooker. Frankenhooker is pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing. Anything by love... uh, Frank Henlotter. Is, yeah. is, as far as I'm concerned, a must see. Yeah. He's he's the Kmart version of uh, Cronenberg. <laughs> yeah, pretty he, much. He, it's all about weird body horror stuff, but made on like a uh, like a bargain budget. It's I never was clear before I saw Frankenhooker whether or not he even was tongue in cheek. I was like, either he's being very tongue in cheek about this, or he's kind of crazy. I think it's a little column A and a little column B. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe, definitely. Maybe so, but uh, this is uh, this is not one of his films. This is a film that I had never heard of, and which really surprised me, being as big of an Evil Dead Two fan as I am because this comes out of that whole little community of guys that work together yeah. on fucking everything with Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi and Ted Raimi and Scott Spiegel who yep. is the co-writer and I believe co-producer of Evil Dead 2 yes that's correct uh, and this was uh, his I, I think it was his first film uh, I'm not 100% on that but anyway it was one of his very early films no it was not his first film I'm sorry his first film was Attack of the Helping Hand so it was his second directed film but Attack of the Helping Hand sounds like Evil Dead 2. <laughs> doesn't it though? That's where they expanded that whole thing. Well, that was just a short film, so I don't know if that maybe counts. maybe that's where it came from. Yeah, actually, it was about a woman being stalked by the hamburger helper hand. So, wow! Yeah. <laughs> Tracking that down. Wow. First person to die in it is Sam Raimi. So, <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah. Uh, That's you know amazing. This is the type of thing that I wish they had put in the bonus features here, which I, I don't believe they did. But, um, you know, here's the thing about Intruder. It's a film <laughs> that I really wanted to like more than yeah. I was capable of liking. There's so many things about it that seem like, oh, God, this is that those hidden gems that you can't believe in. You find it, you're like, oh, it's so even more close, awesome so close. than I could have imagined. And it's just never quite there. You see why it has faded into obscurity. Yeah. It's not terrible. 
it's just maybe it's that I walked into it expecting way too much. I mean, like I said, it stars. It's got Bruce Campbell on it. It's got uh, uh what's his name? The guy from Evil Dead Two played the Hick guy, uh, who is the head owner of the supermarket here. Oh God! You know what? You You're know putting what me on the about, fucking you know? spot, and I'm, I am failing. I apologize for those people that I don't have that information right at hand. But um, yeah, the guy who played the the, the total Hick guy in Evil Dead Two plays one of the lead characters here. Uh, there's. <laughs> Like I said, Ted Raimi's in it. Sam Raimi is in it as one of these people. And it's a bunch of people who work at a supermarket late night. And this one girl who works there is clearly being stalked by an ex-boyfriend who just got out of prison. Who, when pe- bodies start turning up around the place, mm-hmm. which these people, this must be one fucking huge supermarket because it takes them forever. <laughs> it's like a realize. super fucking Walmart. I know, right? It's gi- It must be huge because <laughs> nobody notices that there are all these bodies everywhere. <laughs> and there are a lot of bodies. This thing has a huge body count. Um... You figure it's got to be the boyfriend, right? Except as someone who watches horror. Red they, herring, if yum. They emphasize it that much, then it's clearly not that guy. Yeah, and exactly. 99 times out of 100. And the thing about Intruder, which I felt the same way you did, I was really excited to discover a horror gem, and this turned out to be. It turned out to be like watching somebody try to inflate a bike tire that has a hole in it, <laughs> and they just keep on pumping, and it's like, oh, you're going to. Oh, no, you'll never get there. Uh, what, the thing about this movie is they, they try to do a lot of the same weird cinematography that Evil Dead did. Like, I remember one shot in particular in this movie where they actually filmed someone dialing a phone from inside the phone, yeah. looking out through the rotary, and it's like... There's so much stuff like that where you're like, okay, this is that, it's that weird little period of time with these people, these incredibly creative group of people sure. who were just trying everything new. They're like, nobody's done this yet. Let's try and do this. Let's do this wacky thing. And and then they were just a bunch of uh, uh, almost teenagers, really, just barely past being teenagers yeah. making these films together. And this is an example of the stuff that didn't work. It's everything else. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, you got to give them serious points for trying. Yeah. Greg Nicotero did the horror practical effects, which yep. are the best thing about this. Oh, absolutely. Um, there are points where it doesn't work so well, but there are points where it works really well. And make no mistake, this is super gory stuff at points. And, you know, to, to Synapse credit, they are putting out uh, another Scott Spiegel movie pretty soon that I feel does everything we were hoping this one would do, mm-hmm. which is a movie called Thou Shalt Not Kill Except. Right. Which is a kind of a crazy cult <laughs> versus a military. It's kind of like the A-Team meets the Manson family, which is really, really fun. And actually, Sam Raimi plays the bad guy, and he's so goddamn awesome in Spiegel it. Spiegel didn't direct that, though. He just oh. produced and wrote it. Oh, I'm sorry. That's yeah, correct. Yeah. That's that my was, bad. Uh, uh, what's his name? Carol Cohen. Larry Cohen, I believe, right? No, I'm sorry. It's Josh Becker. We'll oh, okay. There. Okay, yeah. Sorry. but anyway, He was involved. He didn't there, direct. There's a whole period of these films that were coming out around there that they were all working on together. A lot of people don't realize that the Cohen brothers in the, those days were actually involved. Crime well Wave. All this stuff. Mm-hmm. Crime Wave. And uh, they were... Uh, they they had something to do with Evil Dead. I can't remember what. Really? Yeah, they're listed on the credits. Huh. But um, yeah, those guys all went to film school together. Yeah. So yeah, weird as that is, that's why Bruce Campbell's in uh, Fargo. That's correct. Yeah, a lot of people don't even realize that, but when the guys are, what, uh, what, I can't remember the actor's name, but he's watching the, the two criminals when he's watching the soap opera in the cabin. It's Bruce Campbell's the star of the soap opera. <laughs> that's that he's right. watching. <laughs> that's a fun trivia question. Indeed. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I. I like Intruder to in a sort of warm and fuzzy look at this portrait of this picture of time, but as an actual movie, it's probably not all that good. Still, if you're a fan of these guys, it, it kind of is like one of those movies you'd want to own anyway as a completist. Yeah. There's a lot of bonus features on it, as Synapse, feature, Synapse films tend to have. Mm-hmm. Speaking of owning it. Oh, yeah. Speaking of owning it. Thank you for bringing me there. Because... <gasps> Give away! We're going to do this giveaway right in the middle of the segment so people aren't like all like, ah, I'll just go to the end of the thing. No, uh-huh. we're, we're, we're unpredictable like that. Man, we change it up. Don't try to put us in a box. We're going to make it so difficult for you to get free stuff from us, you won't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I've got, we are assholes. Oh, we're such dicks. What I've got here is a whole handful of stuff from Synapse Entertainment, like I said, who have been so good to us, and their releases are, wow, they did Maniac Cop recently. Which, by show. the way, that Maniac Cop release is uh, not only is it great and it pays homage to the movie like it should, but we had never gotten a Maniac Cop release on either format. Well, no, that's not true because their DVD <laughs> release was pretty good. Uh, but no, that is it. Seriously, that, that Synapse Blu-ray release of Maniac Cop is outstanding and you should definitely pick it up it's a great movie and it looks great on their blu-ray synapse are one of the few companies along with maybe shout factory that take classic horror and spend the time to fix it up and make yeah. it good and treat it with respect mm-hmm. and you know like classic being of course 
it it's a dubious term. <laughs> but, but, you know, for those who do consider themselves really serious files, yes. And what I've got here for giveaway is not only do I have three copies of Intruder on Blu-ray, which is, like I said, a movie totally worth seeing. And you God, you know, I felt bad that we both didn't like it as much as we did, because everywhere I read on the net are people calling it a classic and loving. That's it. fantastic. All horror aficionados going, no, I adore that film. OK, well, there's hey, enough man. there that I, I'm totally happy that some people feel that way. Yeah, absolutely. Me, too. It's because it's not a terrible film by no. Much imagination it just it didn't strike the right resonance with me but the film that did i got three copies of motherfucking frankenhooker frankenhooker come on man frankenhooker <laughs> in the, his house <laughs> i'm glad leon's not here because he'd say never do that again hey man don't do that again <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna come back to the whole what I'm black, so you gotta lower your voice. Is that what it is? <laughs> no, it's your voice is just lower than mine. God damn it! <laughs> uh, I I love both. Uh, well, I love Frank and Hooker to death. I really do. I think it couldn't be funnier. Um, it, look it up. Trust me, it's super fun. Totally worth owning, and a movie that you don't want your parents to catch you watching. <laughs> so that alone should be good. Uh, the what is gonna be the giveaway word for both of these films? I don't know. What do you guys think? What about uh, Frankenhooker? What would oh, for Frankenhooker? Uh, oh my gosh. Could be almost anything. Yeah, it really could. Um, I don't know. I, I Shit, I'm, something, I'm blanking. Something, something. Luke! Hooker in a trunk. Hooker in a trunk. Is that too many words? We need word. like one word. It can or... be a phrase. It yeah, hooker in a trunk. Phrase. We'll go oh. hooker in a trunk is the word. All right. I like it. So what about intruder? I think it should be Spiegel. Because not only is that the name of the director, but it sounds like something you yell at people you don't like. And we're not too worried about the spelling. You can phonetic no, it out if you don't bother. Yeah, about we're not we're not looking for exact spelling, just exact everything else. <laughs> exactly. Spiegel! As long as it starts with an S P. Spiegel, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, so let's move on. I actually have to scroll down to see exactly where our next horror movie is, because even I'm unsure. Uh, Burke and Hare, which is not really a horror movie. It's kind of a horror comedy. It's but not really a movie. <laughs> this is one of these songs we're going to kind of disagree on, because while I didn't anywhere near love Burke and Hare, I thought it was kind of entertaining. I thought there was a lot of sequences in it that made me laugh, and I, which makes me happy, because this is the first film in 12 years from John Landis. You know, who's a classic film director. I mean, that guy's made some of the funniest comedies ever made. This not being one no, of them. No, not even to close. To be fair. But I still thought there was a lot going for it. This stars Simon Pegg and Andy Serkis as William Burke and William Hare, respectively. It is based, believe it or not, on a true story and largely clings to the events that happened in uh, England and Edinburgh when I, I shit now i don't even have the information here about when exactly basically this happened, and but uh, uh hold on one second no. oh 1820 <laughs> around 1827 1828 where these two guys who were entrepreneurs discovered that a local scientist <laughs> that's one way to put it <laughs> a local scientist uh played by tom wilkinson here uh, as well as his rival who's richer and has the approval of the crown played by tim curry are looking for bodies so that they can dissect them and there's a sort of contest going on to get approval of the more approval of official stamp from the crown and so a wilkinson who finds himself in a position where he's no longer allowed to get for free executed uh prisoners corpses is looking for them anywhere he can get and, and paying top dollar for and them paying top dollar for bodies which of course leads uh simon burke peg and andy circus to start giving him bodies because like i said they're nothing if not entrepreneurs <laughs> and along the way uh you know when that when the the corpses that just turn up stop doing that, they've got to start making their own corpses. Yep. Now, I, I've i heard some complaints that one of the problems is that this film never delves into its own darkness. It's like, shouldn't this be kind of horrifying? And it never even touches on that. I mean, it's really a, you know, almost a romantic comedy, really, which is an odd thing for these guys who are unquestionably people who deserve to be punished yeah um you know reprehensible people yeah uh like uh, simon Pegg is in love with uh, a young woman who is who is a uh, uh, well i don't want to say any bad things sweeping generalizations about woman but she's a you know i don't want to call her a gold digger <laughs> but she ain't messing with no broke yeah exactly corpse and when people uh, and by, uh, uh, isla uh, uh, fisher 
who of course is gorgeous by the way uh and she wants to uh, promote her play she wants to do all woman's version of macbeth <laughs> and simon Pegg is totally hot for her as i would be i would kill people for for her totally so i totally understand that yeah uh, she's hot <laughs> she is very hot isn't she the one who's married to uh what's his face from borat yes she is in fact married to mr ali g that weirds me out that makes me uncomfortable knowing that she's constantly in touch with that much body oh hair. man it's so hilarious though <laughs> um, i just real quick on the first the first season of ali of the Ali G show uh he was uh, Sasha Baron Cohen was interviewing the former chief of police for the LAPD and he's talking about you know what is legal and what is the definition of legal and what is barely legal and he's like oh yeah actually Isla had this joke about you know the barely legal and the under 18 porn and all this stuff and you're like she's fucking hilarious like she's just <laughs> really really funny I think she has a natural gift for comedy yeah absolutely, absolutely she does. and I thought she was funny in here but not as funny as she should have been her part was rather underwritten on the whole which is when I go to that sweeping generalizations this movie kind of makes the mistake of making her be just like i said just kind of a gold digger character and when it's time for her to be sympathetic it's hard to really buy into that if yeah. anything there's a problem with like i said it, it's uh, these characters it doesn't explore the things that you want them to explore in the right way yeah however i thought a lot of the actual set piece jokes were really pretty funny there's several incidences throughout this movie which is by the way peppered with fantastic comedy actors from throughout British television history. I mean, there's so many great people. Jessica Hines is uh, yes. Andy Serkis, yeah. who's from Space. Mm -hmm. Bill Bailey is the hangman. I mean, there's every time there's a new scene, a new character that pops up, you're like, oh my God, it's the guy from that show. I love that show. I mean, I don't even want to spoil it for you. I would say it's worth seeing if you're a BBC television fan just for the whole spot, the guy who's in that awesome show going. Pretty much. Yeah, because it's, <laughs> it's filled with it. Um, uh, like, like I said, it doesn't really totally function but for the reasons I already said, but you know what, sure. you guys go ahead. And I mean, tell I, I think the doing. biggest thing this is going to come down to for us is, is just like the hangover. Like you think it's funny and we don't like, yeah. I, don't, I don't think either one of us laughed at all during this film. And I, that's the biggest problem. Like it's a comedy and, and it's either going to work for you or it's not. And if it's not, it's going to fall really, really flat. No, cause that's, that's totally what they're going for. You're right. They don't, they don't delve into the, the macabre at all. Which is, I guess, a little unfortunate, maybe. I don't but feel like I, even. I feel like it would have been forgivable if the movie were funnier. I would have, I would have liked a darker tone. I would have liked any real tone at all. Like, I, I just feel like it, things, it felt very bland. It just felt like things were happening because they needed to happen to propel the script. I didn't feel like it was grounded to anything. I didn't feel like <laughs> any of the actors really cared what was happening. And maybe, maybe that's an extension of the fact that if it had been more sinister and the fact that these deeds actually. Like, if the characters had realized the weight of their deeds, that would have at least centered the movie for me. Yeah. But I just felt like there was it was so lighthearted about murder that it felt too light and just got, got away from itself, and I didn't care. Yeah. But, I don't no, know. I, I, I agree with you. I think there are... Uh, there's the At the point in the film where they come back around to saying, oh, now we have to show that at least one of these characters feels bad with his deeds, it feels very unconvincing it feels like a contrivance of the plot and sure. like i said i have big issues with the plot on that level i just thought the actual jokes as it were did more than not work for me here maybe it's just because i'm so in love with a lot of these actors in here but hey, sure and, and simon there... Pegg, i would i would see simon Pegg in anything and simon Pegg in a john landis movie should have been a home run for me and it just it, it fell flat yeah and we've kind of we've kind of skimmed over some of the more technical aspects but just on a technical level this movie looks terrible here we go and Luke, tell really... us why it's really sad. I'm, oh, man. It's really sad because you have John Landis, who is obviously an established director. They shot on film, so there's no, you know, there's no digital, like, oh, we didn't understand the new digital cameras or anything. And the DP is the guy that shot, like, Gladiator, which looks fantastic. You know, like, the DP has shot many big budget films on 35mm film. There's absolutely no reason for this movie to look like shit. And all of the the scenes where things are supposed to be dark and black are navy blue. Hmm. Navy blue is the black of this film, and it's just it's poorly lit. It's poorly color timed. It's just it just looks like shit. It's really kind of surprising. Now, this is Luke, I mean, this is Luke's looks. area. Like this is the shit he knows, and it's stuff that. I, I wouldn't even maybe notice, but then once he pointed it out, I couldn't yeah, like just you stop could for this, seeing it. For this particular yeah. film, which is shot in 2.35, on your widescreen <laughs> television, you're going to see the black bars in the top and the bottom. Just pause a night scene and compare what should be black in the frame to the black bar at the top. And you'll see this huge difference between 
what should be black and what is clearly like a gray blue blob. That's a very digestible way to put it. Like, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's, it's simple. It just practical. looks bad. And yeah. you can look at any other look at you know Rise of the Planet of the Apes in a night scene. And you'll see something that's much, much closer to your the, the black bars. I feel like I don't notice as much when... This is only on DVD, by the way. I don't notice as much when it's on DVD because I expect to see something now when I'm watching those and go like, yeah, this isn't as pleasing to the eye. <laughs> 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 I just don't right. think and about Right, and there, there, are, there are quality differences there, but this is the type of thing that is, is so egregious that even on DVD it should have looked much better. Well, anyway, that was Burke and Hare. Now we're going to move on to one of the movies you actually did care about us talking about. Oh, this shit. Week, which is the re- the remake of Fright Night. Now, once again, I wouldn't call this one of the biggest surprises of the year because I don't think this remake was fantastic. But it was pretty darn good. But, but it is a remake of a film that, I, you know, I guess I can't speak for all of us, but I think we all have a lot of affection for the original Fright oh, Night. yeah. Like, that movie is damn good. Oh, my God. And it's so much fun. And it was one of those situations where it's like, really? They're going to take a movie that us horrophiles really like, they're going to remake it in 3D, and cast fucking Colin Farrell? Yeah. <laughs> like, it had all of the ingredients for just a shitstorm yeah. from us. And, and frankly, it was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> like, li- we expected like it to it. suck, and it didn't. I, You know what? It was one of those films that did sucked. I wouldn't have even been mad about it because I really would have been like, okay, well, there you we go. We all kind of expected it. Yeah. yeah. Well, so... I don't really care. The original movie's still there. It's not the type of film I'd be excited about expanding the mythology or anything. You know, it is what it is. Uh, and yet, even though I felt like for the first maybe 40 minutes of this, they were just reiterating the exact same ground as the original to where it was kind of getting on my nerves. It wasn't that it was done badly. It was like, I already saw this movie. It's, and I can't say it was done See, better I thought they did some, way. I, don't, I thought they did some interesting things where they actually deviated from the original movie. In they fact, did eventually. Well, no, no. At the beginning. Because at the beginning, of, I don't want to get too much into it, but at the beginning of the movie, uh, the main character, Charlie... And, Play, yeah, played by uh, Anton Yelchin. Who's yeah. really good in this movie, by the way. A lot of charisma. Easily carries the movie. I was very surprised that... Because I haven't seen him in much since, you know, Terminator Salvation. which was Star pretty, Trek. Well, yeah, yeah, obviously he's good in Star Trek. But then Terminator Salvation was like, fuck you. Yeah. Um, yes, it is a fuck you. <laughs> but no, like, the thing is, they're not friends at the beginning of this movie. And that seems like such a minor little difference. But it ends up being a huge part of the plot. And, so, and you realize that all throughout the movie, they're comfortable bowing kind of not not bowing but nodding to the original film without completely kowtowing to it i think they do they take a lot of risks in the things they deviate and i think it actually works better for that character later on i i feel like the strengths of this film are where they deviate really and maybe Mm -hmm. it's just because i've seen the original so many goddamn times because back when it came out i was a you know, a super fan, I'm embarrassed to admit. I mean, I saw it several times in the you theater. I owned it on Betamax. I mean, Hell nice. on Betamax. <laughs> I guess somewhere that copy still exists. I think I, I had the most amazing cover art. Uh, it was so great. Uh, like, one of the best of the 80s, I think. Absolutely terrific. And it had uh, the, his girlfriend in it. It was the next door neighbor's wife on Married with Children. Oh, shit. Oh, yeah, nice. you're right. <laughs> that was cool. totally her. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I never really thought she was terribly attractive, except in that movie. Yo, no, you're right, because after that, it was like, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I, like, I, I know Brian and I were sitting around, and there's, a, there's one particular moment near, you know, a first act moment that I'm still not going to spoil, but they choose to kill a character off early, much, much earlier than that character ends up dead in the first one. And Brian and I were just kind of like, huh, that's an interesting choice. Yeah. yeah. Because at the moment, you're like, your, your first reaction is, no, that no, that person is not supposed to die. That, yeah. No, I'm just fuck you. But but giving it a giving it a minute and kind of letting the plot work itself out, you're like, oh, that actually kind of no, works. At first, you're you like, know? you the the tension is gone. Cause you're like, well, obviously I've seen the original. He's not going to die here. And then w- when he does, it's like, oh, wow, yeah, hey, interesting. I yeah. like that. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, once it gets to about the halfway point, in fact, once they introduce David Tennant, who plays a very different version of uh, Peter uh, what's Peter, it? Vincent. Peter, Peter Vincent. Peter Vincent. I really like what they did. With they, the I did too. It. I first. I mean, I love. Obviously, I'm a big Whovian, so I'm like, I was ready for Tennant to do anything great. But the concept of making him like a Chris Angel type yeah, character, yeah, it was it, a great well, From the outside, it irritated the shit out of me. When you see it in the movie, it fucking works like crazy. Yeah, it totally, yeah. Works. totally works. Because we don't. We don't don't have that character like 
Um, like Roddy McDowell played in the in the original, where yeah. we don't have you know, midnight horror hosts anymore. Yeah. We don't have public access like that. Well, you know, not not that anybody. Different, but... Well, I mean, but not that anybody pays attention. That she's no. super relevant right now, so yeah. that totally works. Yeah, Wait, no, so, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So it, it, it was it was a character that needed to be updated. It had to be changed in some way, and I, I think the way that they did it kept the spirit of of the Roddy McDowell character, where it's you know kind of a flim flam guy and, yeah. and you know having that he's not what moment he says of he like is. holy shit like this is real mm-hmm. i thought there was I, a, I like that a lot a very terrific buffy-esque sequence where they're going through his like museum of collectibles in the world of the supernatural that he doesn't believe does shit yeah and is in his great i'm a super rich guy like las vegas penthouse but they're fighting these vampires just busting open glass cage yeah, yeah I thought that and was going an what does awesome, that say oh it's like oh awesome my god set. that was fucking amazing yeah totally such a great set piece uh and like i said from the, the point they meet him on i think this goes from a okay movie to a fucking really good movie i mean it's a film that's fun if you like horror or not although be warned there is actually some pretty fucking gory stuff that happens at points and it's pretty awesome too like one of one of the best scenes in the movie involves a vampire accidentally walking out into the sun and you've seen so many movies that really like belabor it where it's just like oh they're melting and just keeps going this is literally like dum 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 gone and it's like you don't expect it to happen and then you're like holy Holy shit shit. (laughs) It was pretty amazing. <laughs> we were talking. Part one of my biggest problems with it is that, toward, especially towards the end, some of the effects get a little overly rubbery and goofy, yep. and particularly Colin Farrell like changing. You know, it, it's unfortunate on two levels. It's unfortunate because it was K and B effects. Yeah, and these are the guys. I mean, this is Greg Nicotero. These are the guys that pioneered really awesome practical effects work. Oh, yeah. And so you would have loved to have seen them go with a rubber mask or something cool. But just like Brian was saying, like the 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 vampire walking out of the sun is a CG effect and it looked great. Yeah, so it's I not, so too. you know, it's, so there it's is not, some bad CG, but not all the CG. It's, it's, right. It's not, not all the CG is bad, but some not, of it is. It's not always one thing or the other. As people who grew up with practical, I love it when people do practical and choose to make practical, do practical and make it work. I love that. I'm very affectionate towards it, but I really have no issues with CG if it's done well. As long as it's done well. And often yeah. it is. They're getting so much better at it now yeah. that it's starting to be much less of an issue. You know. And I will say Colin Farrell does a really good job in this movie. He, Col- he really he really is bringing it. I am the- not a Colin Farrell hater. Never have been. The only thing I hate about Colin Farrell is that he makes terrible choices. Sure he does. He picks, yeah, he does. But I've never thought he is a bad performer on any level. I, I've liked him in almost everything I've ever seen. Uh, I, fucking In Bruges was just recently. Oh, he In Bruges. Oh, he's great in, in that film. film. Yeah. I think Colin Farrell is just a fine actor. He just needed a better agent. And in particular, age. like the, the sequence where he goes over to borrow the beer, where Yelchin is just starting to suspect him. So it's he doesn't invite him in. Pitch perfect. Oh, yeah. The whole scene is pitch perfect. Yeah. And he's like, he's basically like, I have to feel like his model for this performance was, what if we took Heath Ledger's Joker, took the face paint away, and like, upped his libido by 100,000%. Because he literally like, <laughs> he comes in all intimidating, and you like, he knows that he's got you the whole time, and he's just playing it for laughs, sort of, you know, for, uh, for a certain period of time, and yet... Women just like fall all over themselves in his presence, which they would do whether or not he had power. Sure, right yeah, now. yeah. Well, you know what? That was uh, uh, what the hell was it? That was Fright, Fright Night, Night, the remake. And Fright Night. We're gonna move on just for time. We could probably talk on and on about how much fun that was because it really was. It was a lot but, of fun. But let's move on. Lisa Loeb was in it. Did you realize that? I didn't I, realize that. Was I didn't realize Chris Sarandon made a cameo. Oh, you didn't even see that? Yeah, he was the guy in the I car. I totally missed that. That was Chris Sarandon. Yeah, yeah. I was like so happy. I actually oh. cheered in the theater that he was the guy who played the vampire in the original film, and they gave him a little cameo. I missed that. I'm so yeah, irritated totally, whenever totally a remake fit. or a later reboot or sequel does not make at least a some token effort. effort yeah. Hell, to Rise of the Planet like of the Apes that. brought Charlton Heston into the movie and he was dead. I know, <laughs> right? I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> well, there are so many nods to the original. In that, no, that's but true. A lot of, but they're all very subtle. But let's Actually, move, move... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I just... I was gonna... I, don't, I didn't know where you were going, but if I could really quickly talk about the original film... Oh, it that's actually right. I'm sorry. Oh, shit, yeah. That's even in my the, notes. The original okay. actually got... A Blu-ray release this month. Yeah, much to my surprise because nobody... Nobody heard anything about it. In fact, the only reason that I knew anything about it is because uh, Ryan Rotten over at Shock tweeted a picture of it. He had gotten it off this website called ScreenArchives.com. I have no idea how they got the rights to this. Um, you can bring up the, the Blu-ray.com page for it. Um, but they, they somehow got the rights and they put out 3,000 copies. I have no idea why they did such a limited release, but it's actually it's already sold out. 
and copies are going for hundreds of dollars yeah, it's, it's, on Amazon and eBay. Yeah, I know, because when you told me, I was like, oh, come on, bullshit, that can't be. I saw that came out, too, because every week I go through the list to see sure. if it's new. And sure enough, you're not kidding. It's no, like, and wow, I, it's I, only I, used copies at like 150 160 bucks. And right? I just happened to see it early enough that I that I ordered a copy, and it... It's great. Uh, you know, it's, I, it's a the, great disc. I'm really impressed the, the with it. HD reviews I'm seeing saying, you know, it's not a perfect transfer, but it's certainly not a bad one either. No, no. And it's important all. to note, this movie has never been on Blu-ray before. So the fact that no. this company out of nowhere put one out completely under the radar in limited quantities. Yeah, when the film, the remake was coming out on Blu-ray right at the same time. Why would you underplay that? It was so, yeah, I have it's so no bizarre. idea. Well, it is a really it's strange like situation. An elaborate tax write-off scam of some sort yeah i don't know i really don't know on. but if if for some reason you can get a hold of it at least you're aware of it now because i feel like a lot of people weren't even aware of it yeah it um, arrived at our house and i didn't know it was out on blu-ray <laughs> uh so what do you want to trade for that yeah so <laughs> we, we can work on that. aisha tyler make it happen <laughs> hmm, make it no. so <laughs> i don't need it that bad anyway those are the fright night films but, yes uh sp- Speaking of sexy woman, let's talk about the Underworld film series, which now is getting its Blu-ray release in a set trilogy set. They've all been released separately, of course. And these are a series of very silly, uh, but fast-paced vampire werewolf action films starring, well, the first two star Kate Beckinsale as uh, uh, Celine, a death dealer whose job it is basically to destroy the Lycans, which are werewolves. Uh, for the sake initially verse of the vampire vampires she worked for, but eventually she finds out that those vampires are kind of dicks too. Uh, <laughs> as it goes along, she ends up teaming up with a sort of like werewolf vampire hybrid guy. I don't know. I, it's one of those things. It's a crazy plot to these films. They go all over the goddamn place. You really can't take it too seriously. Uh, they're all a big ripoff of the White Wolf uh, Worlds of Darkness uh, role-playing games. I mean, to the point that there was a lawsuit that was settled in favor of White Wolf. Oh, I didn't know that. Because it's really, no idea. It's really blatant. Just but, egregious. that being said, I'm a huge fan of those White Wolf role-playing games. Uh, Masquerade uh, was the name of the original, original one, which was one of the early LARPs. Uh, okay. Live action role playing ones where the idea was that you actually acted out, mm-hmm. or you could you could do it tabletop too. But it was role playing that was designed to be actual role playing and not just stat building and like oh you killed the dragon oh there's a thing of gold. The idea was that you build characters and not just jangling your dice. Yeah, you were trying to tell a sto- an elaborate story, not just build points. And yeah, that was kind of the point of their whole role playing system. This takes a lot of the themes, a lot of the actual terms from it, and makes it into the series. Okay, I like that series. I really like these movies. I know they're trash, but they're guilty pleasure trash for me. Yeah, this is the the male version of the Twilight argument, I'm just realizing. It's like, yes, this this werewolf versus vampire movie is trash, but I like it anyway, which I'm kind of disturbed because I like these movies too to, for that same reason, but... I'm starting to realize how close to that argument of Twilight that this is. and Well, it's not, if, if anything else, because... All right, so you could say, yes, okay, the, the Twilight of that, because they're both guilty pleasures. But Twilight, what happens in Twilight? I mean, what... What are the this events in Twilight? What actually happens? Stuff never stops happening in the Underworld films. That's very oh true. Oh my god, the plot goes all over the place. It's crazy. And there are no down moments. I mean, if there's a moment where they're romantic, it's just so we can see someone have sex for ten seconds. <laughs> I it's like not, sex. It's not to like sit and moan about, like, oh, you know what? You, you know. It is for guys. You're right. It totally is. It's Kate Beckinsale in a fucking hot, totally leather and latex oh, god, outfits yes. running around fucking doing acrobatics and shooting people and occasionally taking it off yeah Yeah, it is a win 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 situation (laughs) yeah i you know you can tell me oh these are trash i hate them i don't see what you see in them fine (laughs) i'm I'm not i don't think anybody's arguing that they're trash but it's the question is is it enjoyable trash and i feel like it is i i feel like they're super enjoyable in fact i think they get better as they go along which is a rarity for trash films i think i don't don't know about that i I think the first one disagree with you there i think the first two are really fun I think the third one tries to be fun and and falls <laughs> falls short in a little town north or south of fun. Well, but... the only problem I had with Underworld Rise of the Lycans is that I much prefer Kate Beckinsale to uh, the new woman that they brought in, to, in in for this, Rona Mitra, who I don't <laughs> find anywhere near as sexy or as good of a performer. She wasn't. I 
I like Rona Mitra a lot. I mean, I know she's not Kate Beckinsale, but first of all, I don't think Kate Beckinsale is a great actress by any stretch. I think no. I think Rona Mitra can go scene for scene with her as far as acting chops go. Clearly, she's not quite as hot, but I think she's very, very attractive. Yeah, she's. I'm not, all right with Rona Mitra. I still think she looks like a fem- like if Rob Lowe had had a twin sister, is what I. Think. <laughs> <laughs> Something about her that says that to me that I can't disconnect myself from I, I believe me i wish i could you wish you could unsee that i know the moment i saw it, i was like oh my god it was totally rob lowe if it had a twin sister i can't not or see sex it. change <laughs> or sex change exactly you sorry son of a bitch. i mean not i'd still fuck her <laughs> just like that's like the option in case it comes up i want to be clear rona if you're listening i'm not kicking you out of bed for the like being looking like Rob Lowe. But you'd be thinking about the West Wing the whole time you were doing it. I would totally. <laughs> having sex with her would be like having fast paced conversations while walking down hallways <laughs> with my co workers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so this new set comes also with a, a very short extra Blu ray that is with the anime that they made, apparently. That's a little thing that takes place in between the various films with uh, Celine's character. With who has a sort of grudge match with these very old werewolves, and it's okay, but we're talking like eighteen minutes here yeah. total. And you know for a fact that come like May, we're gonna get a, a four disc box set, including the new film. Well, that's the thing is these are the previous Blu-rays. The only difference at all is that they changed so that instead of a digital copy with the third one that comes with it, it's an ultraviolet copy, and they changed the text on the back of the box that says <laughs> the differences. Um, I don't, I don't. I don't even know the difference. I'm not even clear on what this whole ultraviolet thing is, as opposed to the other uh, digital so. copies. The, just the way I briefly understand it is that you know the normal digital copy, you put in the code and you actually download it to your computer and you can physically move that to all your devices. Ultraviolet is trying to make it even more difficult to watch these films by streaming it to your devices. Like you don't actually have a copy of it. You just oh. have the right to stream it i think i don't know it sounds like a bunch of bullshit and it's like if you would just include a dvd i could rip it with handbrake and everything would be fine yeah right and just <laughs> studios trying really really hard to make it difficult to watch their films well it's, which makes you want to go download it because that's easier it's, it's i like, wonder how much more not money... to encourage piracy but if you keep making it hard to watch your movies people are going to go the easier route how much how much more money have they spent on developing technologies like this? Exactly. As opposed to just going, you know what? There's only so much you can do. And doing things like, for instance, having Mission Impossible 4 play in IMAX and have stuff filmed entirely mm-hmm. for that, where people are like, well, you ain't going to get that from your home version. Or films like Hugo that are definitively better to see in 3D in the theater. That's how you get people continuing to to watch stuff and go to the theater not by this fucking endless series of retarded moves like this yeah. but nope. yeah anyway uh sorry uh, so ultraviolet r- sucks rant and that's o- the underworld blu-rays r- rant over that's the underworld blu-rays <laughs> i'm a fan i don't care what anybody says i think they're super fun i go i revisit them regularly sometimes in my clothes sometimes not you know <laughs> it depends on the afternoon and, oh cyrus yeah i know and whether or not uh aisha taylor has returned any of my phone calls so <laughs> it's like painting uh, a clearer picture of our saturday afternoon <laughs> so let's move on to final destination five five null five null destination five null goes west can't they just start calling them maybe not the final destination yeah the word final is really suspect in this series it it really is only more guilty in final fantasy at this point yeah final (laughs) fantasy 38 when will it be the final fantasy no it's the final it's just in chapters oh god (laughs) why eventually it it will end that's just statistically it has to right so i guess by that argument no it doesn't work that way um, but this is one that's, again, not going to be the final destination. I'm sorry. I'm embarrassed to tell you. Despite the fact that the last film was called The Final Destination. What you think would be the idea is that, oh, now we're serious, right? This yeah. is the one that is the last one. No, like not even a year later, I think. We've got Final Destination 5, which this time, of course, starts out with a giant accident. What? Do you even te- yeah, at this point do you even need to explain the plot because it's <clears throat> the same as every other Final Destination movie? A bunch of teenagers 
get caught and killed in this giant disaster here. It's a bridge collapsing. All you need to say is, it's a bridge. And then the one kid goes, <gasps> and comes oh. out, and none of that shit has happened yet, but it's about to. And he goes, ah, we're all gonna die! Everybody get out of here! Everybody get out! And then half the people go, you're, fuck you, douche, whatever. And the other half go, oh, well, let's follow them and see what's going on. And they live, and they're not supposed to live! Because somebody, apparently, is fucking with death! And Ugh. sending messages to kids to let them do that. I mean, what is the deal with that? Okay. You think this is the sort of thing they would want to explore at this point in the story by five movies. Who is the one who is actually sending these psychic messages to these kids? And what is their problem with if that? If death is going to get so pissed off that someone gets a vision and it's so pissed off that he goes after them actively because they survived what they weren't supposed to survive, stop sending them the goddamn visions! Yeah. Well, you know, like, that's what I'm saying. There has to be something. It can't be death unless, like... Like, the afterlife is just, like, some terribly mismanaged corporation, you know? <laughs> we don't know what we're doing. We're just pulling levers. <laughs> it's all I can think, yeah. right? And somebody slipped, like, Lucille Ball was in there, like, eating the chocolates when she couldn't go. I don't know. That's the only thing that makes sense at this point. And the thing is, like, death is so a secondary element to these movies anymore. Like, honestly, death is, is the secondary villain to shoddy construction. Yeah. Because it's just everybody, no one can build a goddamn air conditioning unit or a bridge or first of all, there's a sign as they go onto the bridge that I don't, I've never seen the sign before on an actual highway. It just shows the bridge broken. I'm like, why are there so many cars on a bridge? If the sign says bridge broken, Salisbury missed it, but there's like a little piece like, hanging off where you can see it was like it's like a taped on thing and it's like part of the tape is missing it's uh, not like it shows a broken bridge i know but i'm saying it was like not <laughs> that's not how it was supposed to be you've never it's seen been like caution weathered death. off caution death caution signs? you're going to die and then 30 cars are on the bridge when it collapsed come on you know all that being said i this is one of the less bad final destinations I it's like, better than four i like <laughs> um, i it's got some, you know, like you're saying, as goofy as these things are with these little, uh, what, what's the word I'm, t- I'm looking for? Uh, Rube Goldberg. Rube Goldberg deaths. Yeah. Four totally fucked that up. Like, they had Terribly. no idea how to film those sort of things. Yeah. Terrible. Three fared a little better, but not by much. Two is still the best out of the whole series. But this actually starts to go back to that idea of pretty well planned out Rube Goldberg deaths. So they're fun. You don't know how they're going to play out. Yeah. You're like, okay, uh, you know, you know that some this character's going to die here, but it's really unclear how. Like I said, in, in four, you knew the moment you saw them in the setup how they were going to die. Yeah. It was in a story not interesting. All right, so we get back to that. That's one plus. The other big plus is... Wow, it's got a super clever twist ending. The ending is really good. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome ending. And obviously we're I not, love it. <laughs> obviously we're not going to spoil it, but I do kind of want to give a hint. And the only hint I'm going to give is the word cell phone. <laughs> and, That's it. That's all I'm going to say. I, I will say that you'll appreciate this movie more if you're a fan of the series as opposed to just Definitely. coming in and yeah. watching it alone. I mean, you def- yeah, there's no question. It it relates, it'll, it references earlier films, as some of the others do as well, and you're not going to get some of the jokes unless right. you've seen the yeah. other films. Yeah, it's definitely important to have seen uh, the rest of the films in the series. And I, I mean, at this point, everybody knows what to look for in a Final Destination film. We're here for the kills. Yeah. Everyone is here for the kills. The kills are pretty good. The ending is great, and so the rest of it, you know... Yeah, I mean, at its worst, like, it's it got... It doesn't really matter. Like, I think yeah. it succeeded at what it set out to do. Yeah. At, yeah, at its worst, right. it has terrible dialogue, and some of the setups are really stupid, but at its best, which it does get to several times, it's like playing Mousetrap with Jigsaw. Yeah. I mean, eventually all the pieces fall into place, and you get a great kill. If you're not a fan of this type of film, you're not going to be a fan of this one. No, Plus, not at all. Plus, it stars young Tom Cruise. So. The guy, he looks exactly, exactly like Tom Cruise. Like Tom Cruise. Are you talking Nicholas? D- no, no, I no, no, no. It's Peter uh, Friedkin. Uh, Miles Fisher. Miles right. Fisher, really? Okay. I, I think so. Click on him. Yes, yes yeah. Tom Cruise. Look at I Tom believe, Cruise. No, I think that's a picture right. of Tom Cruise they're using for him. He does look like From that, Dallas, right. Texas, it turns out. Yeah. The kid looks exact, and he has like the same mannerisms yeah. and the same speech. He's cadence. so twitchy, and he's got the big eyebrows. Yeah, it's yeah. weird. He's got Emma Bell, who's super hot. Too, yeah, right? Emma Bell's very, very. And Tony Todd appears again. Of who I don't even does. think was in the last I've got nothing one. Else to which, do. I'm sorry, if you're making a Final Destination film and Tony Todd doesn't show up to say something <laughs> ominous that he probably should have mentioned to the kids in the earlier films, then it's not a Final Destination film. <laughs> My bad. I was on Facebook. Did I not? Sorry, I didn't look up 
<laughs> that you're not allowed to do that either. Voodoo. <laughs> Magic. My bad. <laughs> I love that guy. I, I do too. I don't. I never. I'm never unhappy about seeing Tony Todd appear. Oh, so time. much fun. Yeah. All right. So that was Final Destination Five. Five nil. Destination. Moving on, and this is a smaller film uh, called Chop that came to my attention because of Bloody Disgusting, the website, which is a pretty funny, a pretty good horror site on the whole, mm-hmm. uh, has gotten a deal with these people, and I don't know how they got it. But because uh, we totally need to get this at Spill, I swear to God, <laughs> where they get to like say, "Oh, this is Bloody Disgusting presents," and there's a little ad before the movie for Bloody Disgusting, and the last one they did, which I believe was called Phase Seven. Um, it was a South by Midnight title. Uh, I'm looking it up now because Brian borrowed it from it, me. Actually, yeah, it's Phase Seven. Yeah, Phase Seven was actually really good. I liked it quite a bit. So I was like, "Oh, I'm excited. I want to see what this one is." And I don't care what anybody says. I didn't like this. This one movie much. is god awful. Oh, it's god, really it shitty. It is fucking it's terrible. It's such a piece of There's shit. There's so many good reviews for this online. Fact, oh, wait, wait, wait. Are they, they, they all did... from Bloody Disgusting <laughs> by no, any they're, chance? Like, they're from other horror sites. And I'm like, what is it that you see in this? This has got some of the worst acting in it. Terrible. It's people who don't get the idea it's of really, broad comedy. Really because it's supposed to be a comedy horror, but it is a torture porn. Yeah, let me, let me try horror. and explain the plot of this. And I use that term. Very, Very liberally loosely. here. Okay. Or loosely. Thank you. Loosely here. Uh, a guy is kidnapped by some psycho who tells him that he either has to kill his brother or the person on the phone is going to kill his wife. So he has to make this decision, blah, blah, blah. Turns out, uh, no, they never had his wife, so he just killed his brother. Now this guy's got leverage over him because he knows where the body's buried. And he keeps showing up to, I shit you not, cut pieces off the guy just to torture him. So he just keeps showing up, drugging him, and cutting off another piece. Then... Then he starts inviting people that this guy has dicked over in his life to come and cut pieces off of this guy. And the whole premise here is that it, it'll all stop one way or the other if the guy can just remember what he did to fuck over this guy. Oh, God. Right. Something happened in his past, and as it goes along, uh, we discover this guy was a big crackhead. He fucked over lots of people. Kills a hooker. And he just has no Yeah, there's idea. no one. That, the biggest problem this movie has, there's no one to root for. There is absolutely yeah. no there's one no to root one, for. Th- there's no good. Th- it's like, this guy is a dick. He's been kidnapped by a psychopath. I, you may consider this a spoiler, so if you do and you're curious, stop, stop listening now. When you get to the end to find out what he actually did to that this it's, guy, it's, a shaggy, it's so petty. It's a shaggy dog story. It's so it's fucking petty. It's a shaggy dog joke like, that they build it and they build it and they build it. Oh my god, what can it be? What can it be? And then you're like, really? There is no punchline. It's a kind it's of a thing. Fuck you. It what is he, a fuck yeah, you to the audience. What it does? Yeah, it's a total fuck you to the audience. And what what he actually does to this guy is something that in normal life you'd be like, well, that guy was a dick. And you would go on with your daily fucking life. Yeah, yeah. it's such... You know what? And oh, The script gosh. was written by a petulant it's, child. It's, 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 it, this is an amateur film. It really is. I, I have no idea why this particular film got singled out for distribution. And you hate to be the guy to shit on somebody's baby, but this is the type of film that... You know, it's lazy. It's the, just it's plain not, lazy. It's not good enough to have played South by. It's not good enough to have played Fantastic Fest. You know, this is the type of film that you, if you had seen it at, at even even on a film festival level, you would have been like, "Wow, this really wasn't here's, good enough." To here's play. a great yeah. example of its ineptitude. At one point, this woman who you think is going to cut off his dick says this line, which is, "I think it'd be worse to have a dick but not have any hands to jerk to jerk off, off with." Hand me the axe. And then what does she do? She cuts off his leg. Yeah. Yeah. Still why? has two hands. Why? Still has both Still hands. Still has both hands. Never cuts explains off. why she chooses the leg. There's yep. so much stuff like that in what? this film. I, and I think, uh, all right, did, did we mention this is supposed to be a comedy? Did I mention that this is supposed it's to be a comedy? It's not funny at all. No it's laughs startlingly unfunny. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that these actors are, every single one of them, just fucking awful. They found them it's in an be, extra pool I mean, of the it, worst extras. I honestly kind of feel bad about shitting on this movie because this is obviously... A movie made by amateurs, and that, yeah. and I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean like these people haven't made movies. These people haven't acted in movies. It's poorly shot. It's poorly directed. It's poorly written. It's poorly edited. In any other case, we wouldn't even talk about this movie because what good could it do? But somebody decided to distribute it. Yeah. And so well, and, and there's so many great available. movies that don't get distribution, and this just pisses me off. Yeah, it, I don't know why. Because honestly, it seems like 
you know, bloody disgusting. As the the deal I have is with a company called The Collective, and uh, the lady in charge of that I believe is a, a lady named Roxanne Benjamin, and she's picked up some good stuff. Like she has. Phase Seven is a good pickup. Really good film. I, you know, I know a lot of people hate it, and I totally understand. But I kind of dig Yellow Brick Road, and in, in comparison to Chop. Yellow Brick Road has a kernel of a good idea. Even if you hate it, you have to admit that there's, like, thought. <laughs> there is some kind of that thought movie. that went into it. I, I can't help but feel that there would have been a way to do this good. Because I don't think this is a terrible idea. It's just every degree of its execution is so bad. I mean, no, I everything think it's a pretty terrible idea. I think the idea is lazy. I, I, I don't agree. I don't agree with that. I think there could have been an interesting way to tell this story. Uh, but because I've never seen this story before, uh, as is new at least, and I'll give them points for that. But yeah, like I said, I that's the only thing I can give this film points for because everything else about it is just absolutely terrible. And I don't mean in the sort of fun to watch terrible. I mean in the exhausting to get through terrible. Yes. As you watch a really drunk guy at a bar tell ancient jokes in yeah. a terrible way and he keeps forgetting the punchlines type of way. They should have called this movie Chore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I have I had discussions today with, with people, other critics who I respect a lot, who some for some reason gave this movie a pass, and I I can't understand I, it. I don't understand that either, but there is a movie that we're talking about at the end of our heart uh, oh, this uh, was chop, thing by now me. that was worse Thank you. That was worse than Chop for me, at least, and that's uh, and it got a theatrical release. That's Apollo eighteen. Um, mm, I, worse than Chop. I, no. I hated this so much worse than Chop because yeah. uh, was Chop is is a terrible movie. Like I said, at least I give it points by the fact that at least it's this amateurish, tiny little production, as you said, of people like you hate shitting on it because it's obviously these people new to what they're doing. Yeah, they're, they're trying because it's not going to do them any good right. for you to sit there and tell it. Like uh, I mean, but it does. It they, does. They're the type of people that just need to keep making it does the, it does the consuming public no good to let these guys get a pass either that's my thing it's like no, yes I mean, it's the we don't want to shit on it because they shouldn't you shouldn't spend your money on this but how do they when they look at that box in the in like a video store they see bloody disgusting presents this movie yeah. so it's like oh i know that site obviously this must be a good horror movie yeah, that's un- irresponsible in my opinion it's like, unfortunate it really is yeah. but you know bloody disgusting as the the select site they do have some good stuff coming up. They've got VHS playing at Sundance, which I know a lot of us are really excited to see. So, yeah, well, um, you know, don't don't shy away from the brand. This one in particular is really bad. Hopefully, those guys will keep making movies. And agreed. Get I better. absolutely agreed. agree. Because generally speaking, I, I like what they do over there. Agreed. Um, but uh, Apollo 18, I think, is less excusable because they do have a budget to pull <laughs> from. This is produced by that guy, Timur Benjamin, who did Day Watch and Night Watch and recently the fucking... What was that last name again? <laughs> oh, okay, good. Uh, who did uh, 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 The Darkest Want, Hour wanted. recently. He produced that. And Wanted, he directed that. And actually, I think he directed The Darkest Hour as he well. Um, but this is not directed by him. It's just produced. It, but but, uh, but uh, uh, come on, man. This is just... Uh, this is just bullshit. This is more of them just blatantly going, look, here's this idea we have for another found footage film. It all takes place in two fucking locations inside the capsule of the ship and on the moon, both of which are zero budget things to build. Yeah. You know, uh, so we can actually afford some actors uh, that we want to get and we can, like... You know, audiences love this shit right now. And it is... Talk about lazy. This is one of the laziest films I've seen in as long as I can remember. I mean, the idea being that this... uh, well, like, okay. The Apollo missions, there was no Apollo 18 mission, right? But the, right. the premise of the film is, oh, there was. We just never, we denied it ever happened. Before we get into this, I heard you describe this movie to somebody the other day and totally spoil the ending. Yeah. So, I just... I'm not going to do that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Although I feel like I should, just to say, people go, oh, I can't believe you spoiled the ending. He's like, good. Maybe you won't watch it now. No. <laughs> no. Never, never, never do that. I know, but I'm so tempted because I really, really No, I'm with you. There are movies... It's hard to talk about because that thing that we're talking about is the only thing that happens in the that goddamn is, That middle. is the problem. And it doesn't happen until the fucking third act. The first two acts, literally, are you watching... Nothing. It's like happened. the real world, the moon, and not the interesting fighting, getting drunk in the hot tub, real world. Dude, it's not even interesting. Is that because you're watching like supposed to be like 1974 uh, cameras on a lunar lander, like that look like absolute shit, where you can barely make out what the fuck is going on? You're watching that 
for like an hour yeah, and a half. It's really poor. You didn't need to be that authentic. Like there's authenticity, but not at the expense of of well. You know, theatricality. In their defense, in their defense, the reason that things look shitty in this movie is because of every motherfucker on the paranormal movies who are like, "Oh, I love that the VHS looks like HD." I'm like, you know what, motherfucker? I'd rather see what happens. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want it shot on VHS. <laughs> I know it's supposed. That's called suspension of disbelief. And I hate the fact that oh my god, you it, asshole. It irritates the shit out of me that dimensions playing up the whole game the producers oh no man this is real found footage I shut swear. the fuck up oh really do you really think anybody believes that we anymore? have the internet imdb now. exists yeah. your argument is n- is null and void honestly blair witch was the last film that could get away with that because it was. because, because it was imdb and the internet Wikipedia. weren't weren't prevalent like you couldn't just go and look up these actors yeah so it's over sorry stop doing it that's why the fourth kind doesn't work yeah they exactly. try so hard in the fourth kind and it's like you know what you actually did a pretty good job because while I was sitting in the theater, I was kind of going, holy shit, maybe maybe there's some truth to this. And 10 minutes after I left the theater, I found out that it wasn't true because I can use Google. Yeah. <laughs> My God. Yeah. Well, I can use Google. I, I assumed there was no truth to it because it sounded like the same bullshit that you... Well, I yeah, assumed there was no, no truth because I... Mia Jovovich walks up and goes, no, seriously, guys, this is totally real. It's totally real, believe us. And I'm like, fuck you, no, it's not. That part was bad, but I think the rest of the film did an acceptable job of <laughs> trying like, to look at my it. boob. My nipple is erect. I'm getting the chills, obviously, because of how true <laughs> this story is. And not but see, just like, with, just like with the fourth kind, I think if they had <laughs> just shown us footage and not tried to ram it down our throats that it was real... Uh, there, there are scenes in that movie that They're still creepy. creep me out. Very creepy. I think that Apollo 18 would have worked as a movie if it had just been a narrative feature. Well, if they had taken out yeah, the found gotta, footage bullshit. They gotta, you gotta move the third act up to like okay, act Okay, but one think about half. this. All those boring yeah. moments where we're stuck inside the cabin. What if they could pull out and show like sci-fi vistas and the, and the moon and I like the earth coming up? I, and don't, the- I don't agree because I think that the whole premise of which you won't let me say of what the thing is <laughs> there's no way Damn it right. can come into the plot until the very end of it and it's so retarded it is so absolutely <laughs> ridiculous and I stupid love on it. every level I so love implausible it. that there's just nothing scary Implausible, about it. yes. Oh, Do I still like all, it? Yes. It's resemblance to something that exists in the real world that I'm terrified of makes yeah. it terrifying yeah. yeah there is that there is that but no i i think that there is an interest not that not what it is that's interesting but how they relate that to history that's kind of interesting and i really feel like if they could have just gotten rid of the found footage bullshit and just made a movie like this about astronauts <laughs> on the moon facing a terror they weren't expecting that would have at least been watchable yeah that would have been somewhat interesting. That would have been a movie that we could be like, oh, okay, fine. It didn't work for us, but, eh, nice try. Eh, I don't know. I felt like eh. if you're going to make a, a thing like this, it feels like whatever it is, they should have picked it up along the way instead of once they got there. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things that... It, so much of the movie on the way. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense that it takes place on the moon because this movie has no atmosphere. Ah, uh, Anyway, that's sh- Apollo 18, and that movie is shitty. Yeah. It is shitty. It's in fact, shitty. it's leaving such a bad taste in my mouth, I need to get another Jack and Coke so we can... Uh, uh, move on and do our mop-up segment the final <laughs> sequence where we pull the stuff that didn't necessarily fit in any of the other categories that we were talking about so far so we'll be back after the break and uh we have one last really sizable giveaway for you guys so stay tuned well brian and luke it is time to do the cleanup and you know what that means not it <laughs> oh shit the, oh. the films that we were not necessarily enthusiastic enough to do in the first four parts of this but we're gonna do now uh and there's there's some stuff that i did actually i am kind of a, a psyched to talk about let's we're gonna go through these more quickly though because like i said we've already been here for a while and shit. yeah kudos to you if you're still on board with us and you haven't tuned out well you know this is something they can listen to all month yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but the first thing is that they re-released the Mission Impossible movies, the first three in a Blu-ray set. Now, these are just the exact same films that we have seen in previous uh, editions that have been released. I mean, there's nothing really about them that stand out as different, except that Part 3, the one by J.J. J. Abrams, no longer has the bonus disc. So there are no bonus features on it So they've taken all. bonus features away that were there previously. Now, I know what you're saying. Yes. Why would I even bother bringing this up? Other but than it's the, cheap. Other than the fact that Mission Impossible 4 just came out, and that movie made me so excited about Mission Impossible that I really wanted to give these three films a second chance. Sure. I am glad I did, but I'll get to that in a minute. The reason... 
this is good is because it's twenty dollars yeah. for it's all good, three, for three Blu-rays, and yeah. they're they're good transfers. So, yeah. I mean, twenty dollars yeah. new. I yeah, mean, I'm sure you can find used copies for cheaper than that, and you know how Amazon and various sites like that are. Give it a month, and it'll be even cheaper. You know, Definitely, that's it. Having just come out, price that's a hell of a good price for three pretty goddamn well transferred Blu-rays sure. uh, movies. And you know what? Having rewatched, I've never seen any of these movies more than once before, and all three in their original theatrical release. Oh, I've never okay. gone back and rewatched them. I'm gonna say this. I liked part one a lot more the second time. <laughs> I did not care for it at all when I initially saw it. Really? Well, I was so mad that it wasn't a Mission Impossible film. Yeah. At that, all. That's. I think we're getting more into that. And I think the reason that that argument is cropping up again is because the fourth one is. Is totally a Mission is Impossible Is a Mission film. Impossible yeah. movie. And it highlights how poorly up to now they've been holding true to that, that team dynamic that you know epitomized the show. Well, three does get the team dynamic, but not quite to the degree it should. Not to the degree, yeah. It's, it's like it's it makes concessions towards it. It does a lot better about it, but still too much of the time. It's literally like, show. look, we have a team. Are you happy now? Great. Yeah. Back to the Tom Cruise show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it's... But three gets a lot of credit for Philip Seymour Hoffman as a villain. Oh, three. Ah, I, no, I don't think anyone's... Shit. I don't think anyone's disparaging three. I, I'm I just think... saying. Up until four, three uh, was the just... best one. Yeah. And but... I will say this as as much as that's true and as much as J.J. Abrams wanted to make a film that was more of a gritty spy thriller and less had more of emotional content and less of a you know just big popcorn movie content it it's kind of forgettable sadly you know there are moments that are great Philip Seymour Hoffman's great uh, it certainly makes up a lot of the ill will created by Mission Impossible 2 which is flat out a wow. fucking you know, terrible movie now that you mention that I was, I was going to argue with you but I can't it's remember. Hard to remember it. Yeah. I can't remember a single goddamn sequence from the third one. You know, it's it, that's the problem with it. It is kind of forgettable. It is. As you're watching it, you're going, "No, this is good." But then at the end, you're like, "You know what? It's good, but that's all it is." It's and it's good. it's not just a recency effect. Like it's not just because I just saw the fourth one. I can remember a lot of sequences from the first two. Yeah, I can't remember sequences from the third one. And, and I don't want that to to tell people not to watch it because I think you will. No, the third one. no it's it's good, but it. um, shit. <laughs> that's kind of freaking me out. It was, like I said, the only good thing in two is Thandy Newton's cleavage. That's it. That's the only positive oh, thing I just, have to say about that. Two is abysmal. so over the top. All right. Every 30 seconds, someone is wearing one of those masks where it turns out there's someone else. There is even a sequence two in two where a character is wearing a mask for somebody and he has a flashback for that character <laughs> and then takes his mask off and reveals that it's actually the other guy, except that doesn't make any sense because we just watched him have a flashback for the character he was wearing the mask of. That doesn't make any sense. Well, I had forgot about that, but that sounds awesome. <laughs> oh my God. John Woo. We love you. Kindly stay in Hong Kong and make movies there for the rest of like, your life. The sequence where Tom Cruise has just blown the door off the hinges with a big exp- uh, with a grenade, and he walks by the door in slow motion right after a glowing dove flies oh, through the God. door. Yeah. Glowing dove, yeah. mind you. Not just a regular dove, oh, but a yeah. special variety that only happens in John Woo's films. Uh, no, that is terrible. Part one is actually pretty watchable if you can get past the fact that it is not, in fact, a mission. I think, part. here's the thing. I think if they're judged based on... Uh, f- just film. I think that four and one are kind of equal in my estimation of the best one. If you're judging them based on action films, I don't think you, there's any question that four is the best one. Shit, I don't think if you're judging action films, I can't think of anything in the last couple of years that comes close to Mission Impossible Four. It's but, unreal. Yeah, I think I, Casino Royale is the last the last one that I'm like, all right, Casino Royale. Because of that, yeah, Impossible no, that's a, that's a good argument because mm-hmm. there was that whole free running thing that really blew Casino people. Royale is amazing. I yeah, think it's an action film, but. The thing about Mission Impossible 4 is that I haven't seen audiences recoil like that in horror movies in the last however many years that they were doing a Mission Impossible 4 to the action sequences because they were so... So the the stakes were up so much that it was just like you were biting your nails and like and the, chewing your armrests. The sequence, this I mean, it's the sequence, the sequence with Tom Cruise on the Burj Khalifa in Dubai is just incredibly oh, filled. If you uh, once incredibly, again, I know filled. it's been said all over the site, but if you haven't seen it yet. And you're thinking, should I bother seeing it in IMAX? The answer yes. Is yes. Dear God. Because, even if it's a fake IMAX. Yeah, you will get vertigo watching that sequence. No question. You will, your stomach will be in your throat. Definitely. And just as a pure fan of cinematography, you'll sit there in awe. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's fantastic. And it's, it's so, to me, like, on all levels, it's the best of the films. But, you know, well, like I said, one isn't as bad as I remember. I'm not a big Brian De Palma fan. I know. <gasps> 
but I'm just Fuck not. I, I liked him when he was a kid, <laughs> and now watching his films, going back and rewatching him, I go, wow, this guy is kind of a hack, actually. It's like, he wants, oh, to, be, oh, he oh, wants to be Hitchcock, and he's not even close to being Hitchcock. I just don't... I'm going to brain you. I'm sorry. Oh. I still like a... I was with you when you said you weren't his biggest fan, but when you called him a hack, I almost no, leapt I said, across the room and strangled I you. I said kind of a hack. <laughs> well, I kind of almost Look, killed you. Go watch Rear Window, and then watch Body Double. Uh, yes, and tell I'm, me if you don't feel a little nauseous I, afterwards. I, I am aware that he is 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 copying generously <laughs> from Hitchcock, Heavily. but I think he does. In uh, this is not a Brian De Palma debate. It's not. So let's move on <laughs> to the next title, which is Underbelly. Yeah, which we, is we can Aust- talk about blowouts uh, uh, time. Which is an Australian television series based on a real series of, of killings in Melbourne. Uh, that took place between 1995 and 2004. Now, this was an, th- one of the most popular TV series from Australia e- ever, and I know what you're saying. They have TV in Australia? Sure they do. Now. <laughs> wow. We just lost all of our Australian listeners. Sorry I'm, to both of you. I'm kidding to my friends who come to the dot com. You know who you are. But um, I really, really, really enjoyed the shit out of this show. It's a... For anyone who enjoys like Goodfellas and that sort of stuff, or gangster type films, this is a phenomenally well done series in the vein of The Sopranos, except they don't just sit around watching TV and having dinner for a lot of the time. Uh, it's very violent, it's got lots of sex, it's got an amazing acting and story as you watch this, these guys, the story that plays out following all these criminals, uh, initially this one character who is a complete psycho, and you're like, uh, Alphonse Gangitano, who was called the Black Prince of Ligon Street. And you think, oh, well, obviously this guy's going to be the star of this whole thing. But you know what? He's totally not early on. And as the film goes, different people die off, new characters come in. And eventually, the least likely person that you would guess to be one of the most hideous serial killers and monsters in Australian crime history in the series is, you know, ends up being that guy. You're like, wow, this little tiny runt, like rat-faced Fink dude <laughs> was like one of the most evil people who ever lived. Wow. I clearly did not watch enough of this. It's it's a really great show. I watched about half of the first season. I do not get to finish it yet. And the set that they put out on DVD is three seasons, the second two being prequels. In fact, there's a fourth season airing currently that takes place in the 1920s. Oh, wow. Like with an early crime family. The Both of the, I think, one of the previous ones, the first previous series was in the 70s. The second one's like between 88 and 89 when it took place. But uh, they've all been really highly regarded. This is... I. I don't have to tell you this is so well worth anybody's time who likes I think it is I think it is an investment though like I think if the more you watch it the more you're going to get from it and it's this set especially being so expansive you're really going to want to commit to it well, in order to, to get the full benefit of it cuz I to be completely honest I watched the first episode and I thought it was just fine but that is as excited as I got about it but it seems like from what you were saying as it goes along it gets a lot better. That's what I'm saying, too. It yeah, has titties. Is, it, does it does have, have titties. titties. It has a lot so, of titties. If you're a fan of titties, which I think we all are. It, it <laughs> does not have, like, a knock it out of the park pilot. I agree. Yeah. I mean, it's not bad. You're like, yeah, that was all right. But as it goes along, you start seeing how it's different from other shows. And right. The, different direct, the, the chances it takes. And, yeah, you really do get real worked up into it. I can totally see why it was as popular, why it still is as popular as it is in Australia. Cool. It deserves to be seen wider. But you guys haven't watched it at length, so we're just going to move on. Like I said, we're supposed to be moving through stuff. And that you was know, Underbelly. That was Underbelly. And, like I said, my opinion, well worth your time if you're a TV fan and you like crime stuff. Uh, let's talk about Kino Lober. Ah, yes. Kino Lober is a film company that's been releasing stuff on Blu-ray that they like to release stuff that is very early. Yes. Like, like Criterion does really good copies of stuff that goes all across the board, right? But art and like obscure stuff that is considered by film fans to be masterpieces to some, some degree or another. Uh, but you never know what... Air- error they're going to pick from. Kino Lover likes to pick from the very beginnings of film, as evidenced by some of the stuff that they put out this month. Mm -hmm. Uh, And some of the stuff is actually from before this month, but we just got it. So I'm I'm, I'm talking about it. You'll have to forgive us a little bit. Yeah. Uh, But, for instance, they just put out their yet another version of Metropolis, which is, of course, is the Fritz Lang film. What's different about this version, although they do have the... All right, so a lot of people don't know this, but Metropolis in its complete version didn't even exist until a few years ago. Right. Somebody found a complete version in a vault, and I, I actually I think it was Australia once again, uh, but they found a, a complete version 35 minutes longer than the previous version. 
And that is the complete Metropolis, also available for Kino Lober. It's a pretty amazing story. If you, if you have the time, you should definitely uh, wiki it and, and read the whole story. There's a huge history behind the various restorations that have taken place that are actually pretty interesting. This is from a 1984 version, which was the first modern restoration, like really thorough restoration of it. But what's odd about it and controversial is that it was by this uh, director... and uh, not didn't have his information right here. Hold on, let me pull that up. It was by this uh, uh, creator who decided that he was going to speed it up, tint its color, yeah. um, change the title cards, because it's a silent film, to subtitles, mm-hmm. and soundtrack the whole thing by modern 80s artists like Queen and people like Giorgio that. Moroder yeah, was yeah, Giorgio, Giorgio Moroder. Moroder. A, and he, he also composed some of the music. No, it was very well. controversial, but it was also quite important, because like I said, a lot of people hadn't seen a fixed up version of this film at all and it was the first film that narratively first version of it that narratively made sense yeah where they had put it together and there was enough new footage they had discovered that they could tell it a plot because in the older versions it was literally like you would reach points and it would just go to a screen that said and then you know this character goes here and sees this and then it would jump 20 minutes ahead in the movie because that footage just didn't exist didn't exist and some of it was presumed like they didn't even know for sure what happened they were some they were basing some of it on pieces of the script and then they would just have to kind of fill in the blanks based on assumption so suffice it to say this version it's a it's one interpretation but you might find this interesting there's it certainly has some historical value to it Mm -hmm. um maybe it's the most fun version to watch in that sense and certainly the original version is is a lot longer this is significantly sped up and that's maybe not necessarily a bad thing <laughs> no but for a film purist i can see why that might irritate you it's an alternate version of the film to own if you really want to have the ultimate true to life version of it you want the complete metropolis which came out earlier uh, which kino lorber well, also put which out they also put out yeah uh another film by them uh well there's two discs that came out that are in their buster keaton <laughs> collection and they're getting right to the end of the buster keaton collection as far as the independent stuff they've released all but i think one of the pre-mgm stuff from him yeah. which is basically all the good stuff which by the way if you're not familiar with buster keaton uh just incredible get incredible familiar. performance i i is jackie chan's hero he really he his physical comedy like take away the fact that these were made so many years ago just watch it. if you were to watch somebody do that today it would be impressive. be impressive yeah no 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 i mean and people still don't know how they did a lot of the stuff that he did it's it's really i mean watch something like sherlock junior and you'll understand what we mean there are yeah. sequences in that that today you will blow your mind yeah, he, Absolutely. Is, he is arguably the most influential stuntman of all time to the point that he was a star in his own right. He had his own series of movies, like we said. Sherlock Jr., probably my favorite, hard to say. There's the... Uh, the General. The General, is thank you. Generally uh, considered to be but one of his best. Honestly, movies. almost anything by him in, like I said, the pre-MGM phase is really worth watching. All his independent stuff. And these are... There's one that has Go West and Battling Butler. Go West is... Is is uh, Buster Keaton trying to be a rich guy, uh, or no? I'm sorry, he's a guy trying to be a cowboy who's dropped off in Arizona when he falls off a train, and all the type of humor you'd expect from an incompetent guy who's no good at being a cowboy trying to be a cowboy. <laughs> Battling Butler is a little more unusual, where he's a spoiled rich kid who falls in love with a country girl and has to 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 get the approval of her disapproving mountain parents. Don't ask. <laughs> to pretend to be an up-and-coming new boxer. Uh, well, once again, I don't know why that would happen. <laughs> uh, 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 but, yeah, it ends up this little tiny guy having to fight this huge guy. Yeah, yeah, Martin it's like Sc- the end of Punch-Out! Ex- on it, NES. It's just like that. <laughs> Martin Scorsese has actually claimed it. it was one of the big influences for him when he made Raging Bull. Oh, like, shit. Yeah, believe it or not. Wow. How crazy is that? And it comes with lots and lots of extras on these discs. There's also, I believe the one that you got was Seven Chances? Yes. Okay. Now, Seven Chances was was an odd film that it was actually generally considered to be a pretty goddamn good film, but Keaton hated it yeah. because he was forced into doing it. It was a failed Broadway play that his producer, who was kind of a shyster, I guess, bought the rights to it and said, no, you've got to do this. And so it was one of those things where he was like, this is a terrible story. I mean, it's The Bachelor. <coughs> you ever saw that movie The Bachelor with Chris O'Donnell and Renee Zellweger? Where no. the guys can't inf- get the huge for money, the huge fortune unless he marries I w- somebody. I will say I'm familiar with the story. I've never... F- no, no, I have haven't seen well, this movie. Well, I, I had to see it. And <laughs> I'm a lesser, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm a lesser person for it. Uh, but and the seven chances are in this where there's seven bachelorettes that he has to go through to try and find one that'll marry him. 
And it's very silly. It's a Seven stu- brides for one brother? Pretty much. Okay. It's a really stupid plot, but he makes up for it by doing some of the craziest stunts that he did in his career. Right. So worth watching for just watching him just go like, there's nothing here! We've got to come up with another stunt sequence because there's nothing here! Yeah. And honestly, that's what we're watching at this point, a day and age these films for, is to do it, see him do crazy shit. Right. He was never the actor that Charlie Chaplin was, but... As a physical performer, he's one of the best guys who ever lived. Absolutely, so, hands down. Uh, there is that. And that was the Buster Keaton set, Go West and Battling Butler, as well as Seven Chances. Yes, it was. Now, uh, um, they also put out, and I know, I know, Leon so wanted to be here to talk about this, but Birth of the Nation, which is uh, DW... He actually did. He really did want to be here to talk about this, because he's like, you know, this is a film that there's so much to say, because... It's one, you can't take a history of film class without being made to watch Birth of the Nation. I mean, it's one of the most important movies ever made. It really is. And it also makes heroes out of the Ku Klux Klan. It's a little bit racist. <laughs> it's a little, it's a, to say it's a little bit racist is like. It's to say Michael Richards is a little bit racist. <laughs> um, it really, it, it's. It's totally unfair to this movie to not give it the credit it's due, though, despite that. I mean, for Christ's sakes, the director, D.W. Griffith, who a lot of people consider to be maybe the most important guy in the history of film for all the innovations he brought to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did so much stuff, like for the first time in this and then his next film, Intolerance, which was, by the way, his apology for the racism in this film. (laughs) (laughs) As was several other movies he made later, which he felt so bad about... Like, realizing kind of what he'd done, I suppose. I haven't read a biography or anything, but that is right. what I've gotten from it. Uh, it's a movie that's important to make, and I, I hate to say that because it's over three hours long, and already I can feel everyone yawning. It's important to see. It's part of the. It's part of our film history, man. As it is, I mean, uh, Ro- all right. Here's I'm going to end this with this. Roger Ebert said, "The Birth of a Nation is not a bad film because it argues for evil. Like Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will, it's a great film that argues for evil. To understand how it does so is to learn a great deal about film and and even something about evil. And I think that totally nails wow. this film. It really does. Uh, it, it is important if you really care about the history of film, you should see it. And and Kino Lober. They put in, they spared no expense at putting the set together. It's a it's a gorgeous three it's a really nice set. set up here. Uh, I mean, there's so many extra features. All of his Civil War shorts that he made at the time wow. are on here, which he was very much into. Uh, there's there's just so much. There's interviews with him. You know, God, how mm. would they have to? How much <laughs> did they have to dig to come up with those? You know, Holy um, shit, yeah, man. totally, totally, totally worth watching. Now. Kino Lober doesn't always do old stuff. They also do some new stuff as well, or newish stuff. Uh, and I'm gonna we're gonna skip one of the other ones. This French film called Wrapped because there's just not enough time to go into it. Sure. Uh, although I do recommend it. I, I yeah, we'll just skip that and go to City That's of R A P T Wrapped. Wrapped, not like R A P P E D. Yeah, I'm not sure it even that's what it actually spells, but it, that's the name of the film. Uh, but a City of Life and Death was a film. Uh, that came out in 2009, a Chinese film that's about the rape of Nan King. And by that we mean they literally <laughs> raped the entire city. Yeah, we're not being figurative. Like, they didn't they didn't soil their culture, or they didn't, you know, do something uh, that made them look bad. They, they literally raped an entire fucking city. And, and this took place during the Second Sino-Japanese War, which ended, ended when Jap- Japan was bombed by America at World War II in 1945. Uh, it, it, it was going on before World War II started between China and Japan, as Japan was aggressively, and not for the first time, trying to invade and take over China. These guys have never historically really gotten along all that well. If you uh, watch any of Donnie Yen's movies from the last couple of years, you'll get the you same get, story. You get the idea. <laughs> but it, they, Nanking was the capital of China, and Japan stepped in there, killed, according to China's estimates, and of course Japan has a different accounting, says there were 300,000 deaths and twenty to 80,000 rapes of men, women, and children. Now this film, which is an a, astonishingly well-made film. I mean, cinematography is jaw-dropping. I mean, I gotta tell you, I don't know how you guys felt about this, or even if you got to see this, but I thought this was incredible. I mean, one of those movies that, like Schindler's List, you just have to see and be alone with with your thoughts for a while after you watch it. I I, I mean, I know it's not glorifying it by any stretch of the imagination, but it is interesting for us to kind of follow up a conversation about Birth of a Nation, about how it's an important film, speaking about evil, 
because this is kind of a similar situation. It's like this is a beautifully made film, and it is important, but it's going to be hard to watch because there's a lot of evil in this movie. Except that the birth of the nation is glorifying that. That's what I'm saying. They're not glorifying it in this, but it's still kind of an interesting bridge between the two discussions. And it's... uh... It is really difficult to watch, not in a sense of, of, like, you know, the beauty behind the lens. That's gorgeous. It's a very well-told story. But as it goes along, it just gets darker and darker until you're at points where you go, well, at least that's as dark as it's going to get. Oh, no, you nope. haven't seen the part where they start the rape machine going as they just bring in loads of new women to get raped until they die from being raped too much and then bring the next load in. <sighs> uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> man. Uh, um, you know I need what? to shower just talking about this. If this was like a film that was fictional, I would go, well, that's tasteless and uncalled for. But this is actually what really happened. And it's a story that needs to be told for that reason. Yeah. And it's done, despite what it sounds like what I just said, very tastefully. Uh, extremely well done. I would call this a must-see film. And I am, I, I'm, I'm actually grateful to Kino Lober for putting it out. There, yep. I said it. I'm going to get over Clem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kino Lorber. So you did see this. Uh, I saw uh, the vast majority of it. I actually had to turn it off. Uh, it was too much? It was too... That's, that's one of my buttons. I'm not... I'm not... I mean, we can joke, but, like, I can't watch... I can't watch rape in movies. And I... If there's, like, one or two scenes where it's, you know, integral to the story, not that any of this wasn't, yeah. but it's like, it got to the point where I just... I could, there was so much yeah. that I couldn't... And that's not... I'm not disparaging the film whatsoever as cyrus said it's a story that needs to be told it's but it's so heavy couldn't couldn't get through it couldn't do it it's extremely disturbing yeah there's no question about it i wouldn't even go so far as to say it's necessarily graphic per se it no but it's well i mean there's a lot of nudity but it's no no it's not that it's just it it has emotional resonance yeah a lot of it how can you not be affected by this and i think that's exactly their point they want you to be and it never feels manipulative it's almost fly on the wall in the sense of that it's just saying what happened exactly and that's i mean it's the same reason i, I walked out of uh girl next door which was directed by um uh, gregory wilson gregory wilson with the comedy no 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 no, 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 no. the the one about the uh the girl that was being it was played fantastic fest a few years ago oh i don't know i must have missed it, it was it was, was basically uh, yeah what was it? the same it's the sylvia likens case uh which is a uh <laughs> a court case from Indiana in the mid '60s, I believe, um, and essentially what happened were what was that uh, two girls, uh, sisters, their parents had to leave for the summer for some reason. I mean, again, this was the '60s when people were a lot more trusting, but essentially her parents had to leave for the summer for some reason, so they left their daughters with a neighbor who, for whatever reason decided that it was okay to rape and abuse them. And invite, like, neighborhood and invite boys neighborhood over children the... over to rape Jesus them. Jesus Christ! It was, it was it... incredibly awful. And in similar situation, it is a horrible story, and has a, it actually has a, a message to it, and it is a story that needed to be told, but I had to leave. I was no, like, no, I can't, it's, I can't it's, do it. I, there are two films that, that have been made based off of that. Uh, the Girl Next Door by Gregory Wilson, which played Fantastic Fest. In a movie called uh, An American Crime, uh, starring Ellen Page, which played Sundance, I believe. Um, and I, ha- I haven't seen that film, but Gregory Wilson's film is heartbreaking and jaw-dropping and incredible in the way that it deals with really, really difficult material involving children. And, you know, it's one of those films that you you don't like, necessarily, <laughs> and you don't recommend, Um but you respect and sure. But it was the same situation for me where it's like, I understand this is a story that needs to be told. I don't fault the filmmaker at all, but I need to get out of here. Well, no, I understand (laughs) that. And there are films that are okay. That are that way. I know people have never been able to get through a clockwork orange for the exact same reason. There's a really incredibly disturbing rape sequence in that movie. That's super famous, but there's lots of people who've never watched that film past that point Mm -hmm. because they go, no, I'm sorry. I, I just, I started crying. I couldn't deal with it. It was too much. It's too horrible. But it, they're trying to make us come to terms with this. This shit happens. Yeah. You know, and if you're talking about it in not an exploitative way, but in a, a, a way of, like, reminding us that it's important to understand that, of how evil we're capable of being, those who do not remember history... Doomed to repeat it. Yeah. Anyway, so that's a Kino Lorber discussion. Let's talk about something a little more light, which is Mystery Science Theater... Oh, thank God. Volume 22. Woohoo! Now that Shout Factory has taken it over... 
and and good lord, they've done a fantastic job. I am so so happy that they that Shout Factory took it over because they as soon as they got their first set. The the improvement was was staggering. Oh, oh, right off the bat. I mean, Rhino did just fine, but they did the minimum amount of. Average. They they did yeah as little as as possible. Nice nice uh, box design. It I was nice that. of them to put them out. Yeah. Basically, is the reason we don't we don't shit on them because without them we wouldn't have been able to get them at all. But Shout Factory puts out little mini flyers that come with it with original artwork for each of the movies. They do mm-hmm. brand new bonus features that they put Animated together. menus. They do, like, some of the box sets have, like, figurines of the characters. Like, they're really going all out. And they're pretty good about mixing them up, too, with the different... Uh, films. With like, some Mike and some Joel. Some Mike and some Joel. Yeah. Two different guys who, along the way, have been the human in the <laughs> spaceship of love, or the satellite The satellite of love, of love the uh, SOL. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Living with the robots, Crow and Tom Servo, as they're forced to review bad movies by Dr. Forrester, or later, Pearl Forrester, on Earth. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, this set, we get uh, the two Joels are Time of the Apes and Mighty Jack, which are both the Sandy Frank uh, Frank. producer's version of television shows in Japan that he basically cut apart and made into barely comprehensible. Yeah, like 20 years after they were released on Japanese TV, he bought them and turned them into movies. And the funniest part about that is you watch these incredibly like modern to the late 80s title sequences yeah. and then movies that were clearly made in the 60s. Yeah. And it's like, wait, what? And they're so ridiculous and terrible that I'm kind of glad he did it. Yeah, thank you, Sandy Frank. <laughs> well, it's funny. There's an extra on here where they're talking to like a historian about um, specifically Mighty Jack, which apparently was a very well received show in Japan. But the guy is like, look, this is from. The, I never understood why Sandy Frank chose to do this from the first series because the first series is a very serious spy thriller, mm. and the second series where they went, this is dumb. Let's just make this into more of a pop comedy type of thing and be really goofy. So he's like, the second series is great. First series is kind of shit. Why, <laughs> you know, it's like the way to see it is with robots in front of it. And sure enough, whereas Time of the Apes is a just. <laughs> It's a Planet of the Apes remake. It is one of the worst rip-off. ripoffs of Planet of the Apes I think I've ever seen. And it demands to be seen for that. Yeah, and there's an Italian ripoff uh, called like Revenge from Planet Ape, which is not as bad as Time of the Apes. Now, the other two are The Brute Man, which was the last Rondo Hatton film, who mm-hmm. was just, I forget the name of the disease he had, but uh, it, he was... Uh, he had a physical deformity that made him like his bones kept growing basically in fact if you've seen the rocketeer which we'll talk about in a minute uh the character in there of lothar was specifically based on his on rondo Rondo hatton's performance and appearance in this film and he is he's really distinctive looking It's one of the reasons that universal totally buried this movie because they were getting so many accusations of exploiting his deformity because he Mm -hmm. died of it before it even came out um, the other film in here with with uh, Mike is uh, uh, The Violent Years, which is the most successful Ed Wood film, although not yeah. directed by Ed Wood. He did, in fact, write it, and it's another, it's a teenagers in trouble, rebellious teenagers. Type. Pseudo-pornographic teenagers yeah. in trouble. Just, but it comes uh, with the, one of the best shorts ever. Which, oh, yeah. Which is, uh, what is it, The Youth of Something? God, what do they call that? Like... I, I'm blanking out. Oh, I'm sorry. I totally forgot right now, but I didn't write that down. But here's the thing about it. It's a promotion for electricity. And I'm yeah. not kidding. It's a promotional film for how awesome mm-hmm. electricity is. And it seems like the, what, the 50s <laughs> or whenever it was made is a little too late for that. Yeah, but like you have electricity already, you realize, right? And it's like, no, no, look at our all electric Yes, that's, that's exactly what it, okay. Yeah, I remember now. It's like. The, the son uh, is bringing, like, his friend over, and the daughter's, like, all smitten, so she wants to make him a great dinner to impress him. And he's so clearly gay, I'm sorry. And he's super gay. Oh, my God. But then then you realize, it's not until, like, ten minutes into the short that you realize that it's just an advertisement for electric appliances. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, my God, I remember. It comes screaming back to me, now that you said electricity. It's one of their best shorts ever. The other uh, the other one, uh, The Brute Man, comes with The Chicken of Tomorrow, which is also one of their other great It's so awkward ever. to watch that. <laughs> uh, this this is one of their best sets that Shout Factory's put out, actually. I would agree with that. All four of these are super, super fun. Um, I, I mean, I can't say enough good things about uh, Mighty Jack in particular as yeah. far as how much I enjoyed ver- watching their version of this. Um, they, I, I, I don't want to tell you. They're, they're great. Oh, and one little fact about Sandy Frank you might not know. Do you know what he does now? He's working with the Asylum. 
Oh, I should have yes. known. <laughs> yes. I don't know how I didn't guess Y-E-S. that. Y E S. They don't know. They are the guys who do the like transmorphers and like all. They those. take whatever movie is popular at the time, make a movie that's very similar with an almost identical title, so they don't get sued and try and trick you into renting it. Yup. And you're one, damn right they do, and they bring back '80s pop stars. Yup. Well, one thing I do want to mention about this set, one special feature in particular, is a making of television. Uh, special that was on the Sci-Fi Channel right yes. after they moved over, and it, I mean it's it's a made-for-TV like behind-the-scenes thing. But what's really interesting about it is we actually get to see inside their writers' room. We get to see the props department, which is responsible for the the crazy aesthetic of the ship. Like to date, it is the most that we've ever had of a mystery science theater behind the scenes documentary. Mm -hmm. I mean, like it may be the only one that I'm aware of. And you'll have to correct me if I've missed this, but the one feature that I'm still looking for is they did an Oscar show. Yeah. One year. Not that I've seen yet. And I think it was the year that Titanic was up for best picture. Right. Uh, And they, they trashed all of the best picture nominees and it was so goddamn funny. If they're not, if that's not available, it's probably because they can't get the rights to the footage of the stuff. Probably not. But I, I'm praying for the day that Shout Factory is able to include that as a special feature on one of their releases. Uh, all right, so moving on, and we just talked about this, uh, the Rocketeer. Now, Luke, this, Woo-hoo! Uh, I, you know, I love the they Rocketeer. Finally, put this out on Blu-ray, I much know. to the happiness of so many people who love this film to death. This this Disney 1991 period superhero adventure film made by uh, Joe based, Johnson, made by Joe Johnston, who just did Captain America. In fact, which was another great. In fact, this got movie. him the Captain America. This film. is the movie that he didn't know he was using as an audition to do Captain America. <laughs> exactly, and one of which the reasons, is good because it worked out well. Well, yes. despite the fact this was critically well received, it didn't perform well, and a lot of has been made of discussion of that. And the reasoning is generally given. And I'll tell you right now, the reason I didn't go see it because, like, I don't really want to go see a Disney superhero movie. And that's the largest argument they went. Audience, which is funny because now Disney owns Marvel. <laughs> I know, I know. But at the time, it was like really. So it's going to be a really kiddie friendly superhero movie that just doesn't sound terribly appealing. And then so, it turned out it really wasn't. Audiences stayed away in droves. It was it was dark, and there was like like Nazi conspirators in America in Hollywood, and there was like people getting killed and broken in half, and like there is a lot of adult shit in this movie. <laughs> Um, I really love the fact that uh, you've got uh, Terry O'Quinn as Howard Hughes. I think that's yeah. oh god. Yeah. I mean, he's. I wanted to see a spinoff just about him having his own adventures. That really. would be awesome. Uh, and but, they originally were supposed to have sequels, but like I said, it didn't really sell. I will say this. Shame. Um, all right, so this was at the same time as uh, what's his name who was playing the villain was Timothy uh, Dalton. Yeah, Timothy Dalton was playing just starting to get playing James Bond, which I still think is was a bad this idea. This was this was actually uh, after. Well, no, he was already James Bond. But. Right, he was. It was in the interim between him being James Bond and there not being James Bond movies oh, for six he was, years. He, I think there was one out after. No, no, was, he did one in '87, and then he did one in '89, and that was it. Okay, and this you're, was '90. You're geekier than I am. I, I dude, Bond is one of my things. Bond is. Uh, All right, fair enough. <laughs> but I've always thought Timothy Dalton is a terrible choice to play a good guy. Period. Except maybe yeah, in Flash oh, Gordon. The only exception. Which even in Flash Gordon, he's not. He's an completely anti-hero. good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, just look at the man's face. You don't trust him. No. He's a he's a mustache twirling bad guy here. What he's playing is Errol Flynn mm-hmm. because at the time there was a biography of Errol Flynn out that claimed that Errol Flynn was a Nazi spy, and it wasn't until a few years after this came out that it was disproved. Yeah, that, that was like all a bunch of bullshit that the author, in fact, fake documents, yada yada. But at the time this was playing off that, mm-hmm. so it was clear his character is supposed to his be his character Errol who Flynn. is a movie star, a swashbuckling movie star yeah. who is a Nazi conspirator. Yeah. Mm. Shocking. Uh, <laughs> but Billy Campbell does a great job as the Rocketeer. It's a shame that his career went... I'm like, where the fuck did that yeah, guy go? Yeah, he went yeah. nowhere, unfortunately. Uh, but Jennifer Connelly is gorgeous. Oh, she's so gorgeous here, but the biggest complaint is... Alright, so the original creator, Dave Stevens, who wrote this comic, is really a tribute to Golden Age stuff. A lot of people think it actually was a Golden Age book, and it wasn't. It was a much later day thing in the 80s. Uh, he was a huge Betty Page fan. The, the classic mm-hmm. uh, kinky pinup pen up model. And the girlfriend of the Rocketeer in the series was a nude model modeled after 
Betty Page, which nice. was clearly supposed to be Betty Page. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, he ended up becoming really close friends with Betty Page in real life, and in fact, paid for her to have lawyers to win back legal rights to her likeness. Nice. Yeah, they have very a very cool. touching, there's a very touching story that I hope someone makes a movie about alone, about their friendship. Huh. But my one complaint here is that they chose not to go with the Betty Page look for Jennifer Connelly, because oh my God, can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I'll be imagining for several minutes later. Yeah, I, I can imagine, uh, you know, 10-year-old me having a lot of fun with that VHS. <laughs> Here, here's a funny thing about Jennifer Connelly in this movie, and I wish I was making this up because it sounds like I'm making it up. Her character's name was originally not Jenny. Yeah. But <laughs> she had a... I, God, this is going to sound made up. She had a problem on set with people calling her something other than her actual name. Really? Yeah. Like, they had so many problems, they changed the character's name It should be Ginny. Noted, not, not like a diva problem, but like no, a like memory. A, like, she couldn't, she couldn't separate herself from her own name. Well, she was, all right, so she had already She been, was very young. She had already been in Labyrinth. She probably had a certain amount of celebrity about that. Certainly she had already that, been in Phenomena. I certainly knew that I was paying attention to her after Labyrinth. Yeah, In well. multiple ways I probably were inappropriate. And man in that white she was dress. probably just discovering weed at that point. So, and this know. is a story from the set. It could be, it could be false, but I'm not making it up. <laughs> you can look it up. I will say this is uh, <coughs> this is one of my favorite movies, and I actually haven't bought the Blu-ray yet. And I, there's one reason, one reason alone. It, it's still like twenty bucks on Amazon, and there's not one special feature. To no, nothing, nothing. There's a bare bones disc, and I can't see paying more than about ten bucks for no, it. No, and you're right. That's it which is really a shame. It should never have been priced over ten bucks. It's, it's ridiculous. Re- well, and it's it's just a shame that they didn't. I wish they had taken more time to put some something together. Like well, Johnston was a huge fan of the comic. He obviously just came off Captain America. I can't imagine that it would have taken that much to track him down, sit him down, and do an interview. Well, exactly. How much would the guy would have loved to have given a chance to revisit that film and say, "Look, this is or commentary." I, I was pr- he was proud of this film. Yeah, I would love to hear a Joe Johnston commentary for the Rocketeer. I love the fact that Dave Stevens, the comic book writer artist who did the book, loved the movie. I love it when you hear those stories. Where he's like, "Oh, I don't care how it did in the theater." I mean, I you know he does care. He would right, like if there's more, but he was proud of the film. He thought it captured what the 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 book was about. So. It's got this great art deco thing all the way through it that's really cool. And um, if I could plug something for just a moment, my yeah. my, uh, my wife has an Etsy shop where she does custom painted Chuck Taylors, uh, and this is it's called Peregrine <coughs> Peregrine like the Falcon Paints, uh, which is the name of the Etsy shop. And she just did a pair of Rocketeer shoes for somebody. They look are, incredible. Oh, they look like the poster, like the Art Deco poster that Disney put I out. Can, I can actually hear fish having a fish gasm right. Right. Now. Yeah. I'll so. I'll, link, I'll include a link in the comment section if anyone's interested. But I just thought I'd throw that out there. All right. Well, moving ahead, that was of course the Rocketeer. Now we're going to talk about Heavenly Creatures, which finally gets a Blu-ray release. See, as much as you were looking forward to Rocketeer, I was looking forward to Heavenly Creatures, which is go. one of my favorite Peter Jackson films. And naturally, that's saying something because he's Peter Jackson. This is the movie that he didn't do right before Lord of the Rings. In fact, there was a smaller film called Forgotten Silver he did between those. But it is the film that got him the deal to do Lord of the Rings. In fact, I have an ex-girlfriend who will, in fact, attest that when we walked out of seeing Heavenly Creatures, I said, we just saw the guy who should do Lord of the Rings. And yeah, I he wants right. that noted. I so that I'm, noted. I'm writing it down right now. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine what you saw in it other than, you know, Middle Earth in the wide shots. Well, no, the whole thing was the way that he did these fantasy sequences. Because this film, which was the first movie that he did was that was not just a genre movie, like the Dead Alive, which was before this, uh, is based on a real story that took place in New Zealand with two girls, two young girls who ended up murdering the mother of one of them. And uh, both these girls were underage and they ended up being the basically the legal when it, the, the law said, okay, well, you have to be separated for life. You're never allowed to speak again. Yeah, I've never heard of that before, and that seems really difficult to enforce. But it is what actually happened, and apparently yeah, they strange. never apparently they never have communicated since. They live very far away from each other. There was a lot of controversy after the fact as people inevitably tracked them down. Neither one of them happy about that or yeah. the fact this movie was made at all. But he created a really astonishing film, both visually and just plain story wise it was the debut of kate a young kate winslet and melanie linsky who you may not know the name as well but recently she was in the informant you've seen her in a lot of stuff you just yeah. didn't realize that you saw she looks her. like a cusack she does look like she a looks cusack. like the lost cusack yeah exactly where it was clear that the male chromosomes work better in that family exactly <laughs> uh, 
But it's these two girls who end up becoming best friends who both have suffered from childhood in, uh, illnesses. They're, it's during the 50s. Um, they end up, they're, they're both have very different backgrounds and yet they become so close that it's, it's pretty much a lesbian relationship, but that of a young girls so young that they really don't know what they're doing. Close enough to a lesbian relationship that a, a very conservative society sees it as a problem. Right. And they live in this fantasy world that they've created for themselves as they write this story back and, war, back and forth about handsome princes and, and various things that happen in fantasy worlds. That mm-hmm. They've built little clay models of all of them together. I mean, it becomes so all-encompassing that reality itself loses its luster of interest where all they want to do is be around each other and spend time with each other until it's just regardless of having your sympathies with them initially there's no mistake it's a psychosis right and the most interesting parts of the movie are, are where that line keeps breaking down between fantasy and reality i think one of my favorite shots in the whole movie is they're building a sandcastle and it the camera is on the beach like you know, panning toward the castle, and then it goes inside, yeah. and it's clearly a set now, but it's still completely made of sand, or at least it looks like it, and has, like, giant <coughs> seashell decorum, and, like, you you really feel, more than anything else, like you've been transported inside a sandcastle, and it's one of those things that i just never seen in a movie before. Yeah. I've never seen them, like, completely and perfectly recreate a sandcastle, and then seamlessly blend the shot so it looks like you've, you've magically changed size, like... It's a really interesting movie. Visually, it's it's striking. Well, so much of it we, we see taking place inside their own imaginations as sure. the way kids will do is they just, they LARP through their fantasy, right. basically. <laughs> and they're, the characters in their fantasy are walking, talking, clay figure, figurines. That, that yeah, that, I think that's what's so interesting to me about it visually is the, uh, and obviously Peter Jackson's firm Weta and uh, a guy named Richard Taylor is primarily responsible for a lot of these effects and deserves a shit ton of credit for them but you know there's this there's this idea that the girls are making these models out of clay and when you see like these giant moving clay people that are real to them in their imagination it's just mind-blowing yeah because it's it's not a hugely budgeted film and it's just really really impressive uh what early early weta was able to create Definitely. Yeah, totally love this movie. We're going to move on, though, just if nothing. I could talk about this movie for hours, but i got to call Heavenly myself Creatures. back. That was Heavenly Creatures. I love that movie so much. Can't recommend it more. How about another movie that finally came out on Blu-ray that I also can't recommend more is City of God. Oh, such a great film. This film, a lot of people just are like, I never even heard of that. It was nominated for four Oscars. This is one of incredible films. Yeah, this uh, is one of my favorite films of all time. It's, uh, it was, it's from Rio de Janeiro, mm-hmm. and it is a... Uh, elaborate crime thriller mm. about like young people in the slums uh, who build these gangs and a gang war that that popped up and this is all based on a true story too by the way which mm. i didn't realize till i saw this version it's of it. it's got to be based on several true stories because that's one of the most interesting parts about it and when uh when attack the block came out the really trendy thing that people were calling it was super eight mile hmm. and i was like Honestly, I feel like this movie has more in common with City of God than it does either of those movies. In that, I can see that. they actually make the poverty and and the slums its own character. Yeah, and and that's what's great about this movie is it focuses on some characters, but really what it's about is the changing crime dynamic of this area, and it does it in a way that's both beautiful and sad. I mean, the cinematography in this is groundbreaking there's no other way to say it i mean and it's not in that sort of like slow atmospheric roger deacon sort of way which like i'm not criticizing i'm just saying it's a different style i'm saying it's more in the really fast paced uh sense of of something always happening sort of way uh, I, even when nothing's happening there's always the feeling in this film that you're missing something that something's about to happen yeah there's a tenseness of things just barely similar you always feel like you're on the edge of anarchy yeah and you are shit. and you really are <laughs> you know and it follows this kid who just wants to he doesn't want to be a criminal he wants to be a photographer mm-hmm. right and growing up in the middle of this huge mess where everyone he knows is involved in crime because really there's just nothing else that's worth doing yeah, everything else yeah. is shit mm-hmm. you know if you're not in crime you're no one getting a real job is point you can't survive on a real job uh and it's an expose of the politics of the and the social situation going on there. In fact, this Blu-ray comes with a really great one-hour documentary about just that, that, hmm. that hasn't been on previous versions, showing, okay, here's the real story, what's going on here. Um, 
one thing I did not know is that every actor in here, except for the white, the French actor who played Carrot mm-hmm. on the gang they're not. they weren't actors. Nope, they're they just, were they're real people kids from the slums. From the slums that they pulled out that in a, after That's a series so of auditions, about it put them in an acting camp for a couple months, and then said, "Okay, we're going to do this movie." And you can't believe it because the no, performances it's, they're incredible, oh amazing. All of them are incredible. So great. Yeah, this is if there was a must see film that that you uh, most of you probably haven't even heard of i hate to say this is one of Corey's favorite films i actually gave him a copy of this for christmas oh this yeah year. It's, uh, but blue like I'm, I'm with brian this is definitely the film that a film that we can go back to and say this is one of the best films ever made it's, yeah uh, and that sounds like hyperbole but it's, it's not it's true it's one of the best films i know i've ever seen it's not hyperbole it's completely true <laughs> Okay, so one last thing, and we're going to have to wrap this up because it's already past our bedtimes. <laughs> uh, and that is the new Showtime series, The Borgias. Now, I've been this has been on my radar for a while because, all right, come on, The Borgias, they're like one of the, like, like what was it you were saying earlier about the Vatican? Oh, yeah, it's it, this, this proposes the really incendiary thought that at one time there was misdeeds going on related to the Catholic Church. What? And I know that's hard for us to, to comprehend now that they're so squeaky clean, but at one time, and this was a really fucked up organization. And the Borgias were a family that were, like, not just this generation, but several generations afterwards, involved in some pretty serious and heinous misdeeds in, that, in Rome and that part of the world in general. They're generally associated with the concept of using poison to... Machiavelli your way through success. Yeah. Uh, and this takes place early, kind of early in their dynasty. With uh, It Jer- starts in the year 1492, which I only remember because it came up on the screen and that was the same year Columbus discovered America. Well, Jeremy... Sailed the ocean blue, I think, is how the line Oh, goes. that's right. That's right. Yes. Yeah, come on, get it straight. <laughs> Jeez. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Why do we even bother alliterating for you Man, if you're not going to remember it? It is late if I'm getting shit for not remembering a nursery rhyme I was taught in kindergarten. Uh, but Jeremy Irons plays Pope Alexander the Sixth, who is indeed the, uh, the the daddy of of uh, Rodrigo Borgia, who tricks and lies and bribes his way to become the new pope when the old one dies. The old pope already being aware that all, as we see him still alive in the beginning that all these cardinals around him are a bunch of corrupt money grubbing douchebags <laughs> that there's so much corruption he flat out says it on his deathbed i really hope that whichever one of you assholes ends up taking over next that you realize that we kind of fucked this up this is all shit uh, including he himself, who apparently, as we discover, had any number of series of bastards and 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 uh, mistresses. Which guess what? Pope's not supposed to sleep with anybody. What this what this movie what movie what this show clearly illustrates for us is how spectacularly our educations failed us, our schools failed us in not making this shit interesting in history class. There is so much sex and blood and evil and like the first episode has you hooked, and then you realize that. You can't really spoil anything because if you've read any history books, you know what's going to happen. And yet, it's far more interesting to see on a Showtime series. No. Well, I mean, once again, it's Jeremy Irons, first off, who is so great. And and he's I, I, I'm a huge fan of him and a huge fan in this series. I, I did get to watch this whole thing, fortunately, and I can hardly wait for the second season to start. If I had a criticism of it... It's just that sometimes it falls too deeply into who's fucking who type of stuff and soap yeah. opery type elements where I'm much more interested in seeing who's fucking over who. Which yeah. is the, you know, I mean, this is the Borgias. I want to see about who's getting murdered. And the most interesting stuff for that is actually happening with his son, Cesar, played by Francois Arnaud, who is, uh, he's a, his consigliere in the church, his number two guy, basically. They but, use the same fucking word as the, the tagline. Yeah. The tagline for this series was the world's first crime family. Yes, it is. And uh, awesome. Yeah. He's he doesn't want to be in that position. He it's wants to be what his scary. wimpier brother is, which is in charge of the military, because he wants to fuck women and he wants to go out and do stuff. But as it goes along, he realizes, oh, you can still do all that stuff here. Because oh, you're a cardinal doesn't mean you can't fuck people and kill them. You know, uh, <laughs> you can be cardinal sin. And there's this. I... Th- Boing! He has this weird relationship with his sister, Lucrezia, uh, played by Holiday Granger, where it's not incestuous, but it's gonna get Okay, I will say this. I only watched the first couple episodes, but am I wrong, or isn't that name associated with serial murder? Yeah, she was one of the famous poisoners. Okay, I was like, that name sounds... 
goddamn well, familiar. At least in stories. From what I've read, what I've read the actual, her actual like history is largely conjecture, apparently. Well, I remember, like, and this is a weird way to remember it, but there's, uh, you know, those movies about wax figures that come to life, and they're yeah. wax figures of killers. There was a bunch made in, like, the Oh, 60s. Waxworks. Um, yeah, I think it was actually, like, horror in the wax museum that I'm thinking of. And they started just listing their cast of of evil wax figures. And I remember the name, Lucretia Borgia. So I was like, isn't she, like, a serial murderer? And uh, yes and no, I don't know. Apparently, everything I've been reading says like there's a lot of stuff that's been asserted that she was, and a lot of other stuff that's like, well, to be fair, no one really knows, right. but so much about her it could have been other people. But yeah, in the context of the series, even though she is the sweet young innocent of the show, mm-hmm. by the end of the first season, it is clear that she has learned a lot from her family. Indeed, and she literally stops the French from destroying Rome through feminine wiles. <laughs> you know, which is basically true, too, apparently. Thanks, vagina. I know, right? Sometimes it's useful. <laughs> there, there's a lot of good stuff going on here. You're not actually going to be wow. familiar with a lot of the actors in here, except for maybe there's some people you're like, oh, yes, I... Um, yeah, I was going to say, was Cole Fiore, I think, is a fantastic actor. Yeah. I, was really, I hope he pops up. Well, he's the kind of the villain of the series as much as, like, every... Well, you know, everyone is a villain. Everyone's but, a villain, yeah. But he He's the, the, the villain to the villains. Uh, he's not a good guy either. He's just as corrupt. He's just pissed he didn't become Pope. So right. he's trying to manipulate the whole civilized world to turn against Rome, basically, throughout the length of the first season. And he's quite good at it. He's, it's a, he's like I said, he's, he believes what he's saying is right, but only because he's so wrapped up in how awesome he thinks he is. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff going on. God, there. I love history on TV. Uh, so much sexier. shit. Emmanuel Shariki is in this. There's there's a lot. She of, is so of, hot. A lot oh of great actors God. coming. There's lots of sex. There's lots of nudity. There's lots of violence. Dude, there's this Emmanuel great guy. Shariki gets naked. I'm in. <laughs> there's a great guy who's an assassin that works for uh, Cesar who kills people in the nastiest, bloodiest ways throughout. The Machiavellis are actually characters in here. I keep joking, saying I can't describe this plot as Machiavellian because <laughs> the uh, Machiavelli show. Up. They actually show up, so it would be awkward. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, and this this assassin guy, all he's missing is a white hood. Yeah, like he's basically the guy from Assassin's Creed. Yeah, right. Who is Batman, by the way? Yes, exactly. I, I don't know if you figured that out. But he, that that guy is Batman. Man, we're just traveling through like a geek rabbit hole right now. We totally are. But that's what remote viewing is, isn't it? That is everything that's great about remote viewing. And. Except for one last thing, we gotta wrap it up. Oh. Do you know what that last thing is? Giveaway! Giveaway! Well, you nailed it. We got one <laughs> last thing in giveaways. We got two things here to give away. First off, I have Vietnam in HD. Now, last month we gave away World War II in HD, which is an absolutely spectacular series using actual footage from that time, a lot of which was unseen until that series, and spending a lot of money to upgrade it to tell that story. Now we've got Vietnam and HD, which naturally was a lot later, and naturally there was a lot more footage to speak of uh, involved with that. And it's, I think, the better of the two series, at least to me personally, for the for you know the conceit that it's trying to do there. Uh, it's narrated by Michael C. Hall, who of course is Dexter, and it tells the story of 13 different Americans during the Vietnam War using this footage, all voiced over by various well-known actors. Uh, Adrian Grenier, Kevin Connolly, Blair Underwood, Tempest Bledsoe, Zachary Levi, James Marsden, Jennifer Love Hewitt, Army Hammer, Dylan McDermott, Dean Cain. I mean, it's actually a pretty re- respectable group of people that the History Channel got to come on to do these things in this six episodes, and they're really gorgeous looking. Anyway, we've got the Blu-ray of that, and actually, hold on, let me check. I have two Blu-rays of that and a DVD to give away. Cause, so let me know when we do this one, which, what's the code word? Apocalypse Now. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> when 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 uh, we go through the rules and you tell me Apocalypse Now, tell me if you prefer the DVD or the Blu-ray, because maybe you're one of those folks out there that doesn't have a Blu-ray player. The other thing I got to give away is this set, and I, I actually really enjoyed this series, despite the fact that it's a little, it's a little silly, it's a little put together in a sort of pop sort of way. It's a neat historical, like, speed course through America. It's America, the story of us, and it, this is... Uh, the Super Set DVD gift set version of it that comes with the entire original 12-part series, a 400-page companion book, and a brand new bonus disc that has a, a new episode called Modern Marvel's The Statue of Liberty on it. And like I said, I, I didn't watch the Statue of Liberty thing. I have not seen that. But it comes with 
the, the show itself is super fun. And, is, you know, we all studied this in school, those of us in America. And I forgot about a lot of this. Yeah. So it was kind of a neat way to refresh it. And it's done in a very fast-paced, almost too fast-paced for a serious... Like, it turns out the Machiavellis show. were poisoning the Statue of Liberty and having who, sex with its sister. Who knew? Uh, <laughs> what's the code word for that one? Baseball. Baseball, that's... Cool. I was actually going to say apple pie, so that totally works. We'll go with baseball. All right, so that's it. Those are the giveaways. That was Remote Viewing Episode 2. What do you think, guys? I thought it was amazing. I must listen. And <laughs> Four stars! Four stars! Two L- thumbs up! Lousy bonus features, though. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> For this kind of time that I put into listening to a podcast, I expect something a little extra. Well, that's because the, the bonus features are us. Coming up next week... The commentary for this episode of Remote Viewing. <laughs> Our drunken commentary. <laughs> no, I think that's what the comment pages are for. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I won't look at them. <laughs> oh, we will. I'm It'll a little happen. frightened now. But anyway, thanks so much for joining us. And we'll be back maybe sooner than a month. From what I'm hearing, the powers that be are kind of pleased. So it'd be nice if we could come back sooner and have less time to be sitting here recording absolutely so yeah. listen up listen to the podcast tell your friends spread it around and again as cyrus said thank you so much for listening <laughs>